Uh, this is just a topic that was discussed last board meeting, just bringing it back in case there's any further questions or concerns about what was presented in regards to uh, possible estimate for the demolition of the building, as well as current estimates for what it would cost to renovate and reestablish that home to be livable. Um, it is on as an action item tonight. And so again, just if there's any questions that I could finalize an answer for the board, we do have funds that are designated for that purpose if we so decide to move forward with that plan. Questions? Steve? Um, yeah. Is there any historical sentiment value in the community related to this structure? Um, maybe somewhat. I mean, it's a family. It was a family home, but I'm talking about the family. But I haven't heard anything, and I think they would rather have it not become an eyesore than to just do nothing about it. I mean, I, I think they'd rather have it removed than not removed. Because, like we said, there's been some graffiti and vandalism, correct? Yeah, on the inside of it. So I think we're okay with it. That, that was my only concern. Possibly raising it. Um, have you talked to the family at all, Kyle? I, I haven't visited with the Reds, no, specifically that family. Is that what you're referring to? But I don't, I don't, I don't even see them over there at all, ever. So I kind of highly doubt it. Would you think so? Yeah, I wouldn't be sure. I just don't know. It'd be an interesting. It's an interesting question. So. And if the board wished me to, I mean, I could reach out to them and discuss that with them. I don't know that we're necessarily the point where we'd like to sell it or anything. But sorry. No, you're good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I'm not talking about just the family. I'm talking about the broader context. You know, is it a on a solo historical type structure? I don't think so. I don't think so. So, and I think they know that because it's adjacent to the school, that property is valuable for the school, so I don't think it's, I think we're fine. I will say, ironically, I received a call this morning of a, well, someone wanted to rent the home, so mm -hmm. out of the blue came. Okay. All right, anything else? Okay, let's go to our second one, Kyle. Um, just to give the board a, a current update on, on current projects, I just wanted to briefly go over these. Um, and give some additional potential timelines. Um, as you can see, I've attached some pictures of the track projects. Monument Valley and Whitehorse High School are currently complete. Um, Monticello High School, in addition to San Juan High School, are planned for the end of this month. San Juan High School um, was evaluated last year when we preliminarily had the discussion about redoing the tracks to find out the current status of that. Um, track to see whether or not or how long we would be looking before needing to replace or redo the top on that. Um, based on the analysis that we found last fall, it was discussed that we would have approximately one more winter by which we would be able to address that top layer and just do a top sealant layer to get another seven to 12 years out of it, as opposed to going into a renovation process of having to not only fill the top layer, but also um, the base layer down to the asphalt or the concrete to be able to rebuild that. It's a difference of about $380,000. So there's been money designated set aside in the current capital budget to accommodate for that uh, retopper of the San Juan High School. And so the plan is to do that in addition to uh, finishing up the Monticello High School track to save that money and elongate the life of that track without having to spend more money in the next couple of years to redo it entirely. Um, so again, that's planned for the end of this month. Um, we have asphalt projects that will be going on this summer. Uh, Blinding Elementary School in the North and Southern Playground will be redone. Um, ZLB parking lot at San Juan High School. Uh, San Juan High will also have some asphalt work done in the Southern parking lot and also behind the, the main uh, structure. Montezuma Creek Playground areas. Um, district office will be doing some crack seal here. Monticello High School, Albert R. Lyman, Monument Valley. The bus barn in Whitehorse High School will also see some asphalt projects that are projected for the summer. Um, we're also currently working on putting together a bid package for a, um, Albert R. Lyman classroom expansion slash office expansion that will be in the back courtyard of Albert R. Lyman. Working on getting the specs right now from Jones and DeMille Engineering as well as um, the project specs for what that job would look like to be able to put that out for bids. This would allow and offer some additional intervention space in addition to administrative space in existing area in Albert R. Lyman. Um, while still, or also allowing for an additional space that can be used by the faculty and staff for different meeting areas um, that would benefit them greatly. So 
we're working on putting that together right now to kind of see what the comps would be on that. Uh, the estimate is, is anywhere from 200 to 225,000 preliminarily. Um, we do have money that's set aside for that project. If it does come in, the appropriate numbers that we could afford it in this year's capital project um, budget. Um, I have a question about that. Was that, I, I'm just not specifically remembering that. Was that on um, the priority list that we uh, approved in the past? No, this is a new addition that we'd be looking at for Albert Arlinden. So it hasn't been on. It was a discussion that started last fall um, with the need of intervention space. We were looking at potentially being able to use some of the space across the street um, in the Blanding Health Building. Can't remember exactly what that building's called up there. Directly east of Albert Arlinden. After looking into liability possibilities and responsibilities for that. Um, they did not feel comfortable in allowing us to be able to utilize that space. And so that then pushed us back onto our own grounds to look and see what we could do. So we began to evaluate and look at the possible, or the possibility of bringing in some outside, um, not connexes, but some outside portable units. We've tried to steer away from those because the cost value that you spend on those after establishing the utility lines and, and long-term long value of those is just extremely low. So we began to look at Albert Alignment with some of the usable space we have there and uh, had some preliminary discussions with Trihurst Construction as well as some of the local contractors to see what our possibilities would be based on the current structure for an expansion um, basically off of one of the classrooms and our old classroom spaces and being able to split and change that current classroom structure to offer three different offices within that current space in addition to this additional open area that would offer again additional intervention space as well as staff meeting area for Albert Lyman, which, which they're in, in bad need of. They don't have enough space to adequate the resources and services they need to offer students. So it, it's not on a previous um, capital list. This is something that started last fall, we began to evaluate and look at possibilities. As we've added to our uh, social workers and criteria and staff, space has become a real issue. Um, having the appropriate space, the appropriate counseling rooms, has really been a concern across the district. ARL and Blanding Elementary are probably two of the most concerning areas where we really lack the ability to have office space and have uh, appropriate confidential counseling type rooms and those kind of things. So we really are scrambling with how to meet those needs. There was discussions when I went back and looked at some of the preliminary plans and outline for that building. There was discussions anywhere from seven to eight years ago about how to add different space to that building, um, also pending a front office restructure or expansion of that building, um, which are in the five to 10 year plans for that building. So this would be something that would help to accommodate more immediately the needs that we have at that, that school without having to wait that five or 10 year period. And it would be reasonable that we could sustain those within our current ongoing budget for capital. Um, good news, yesterday Fire Marshal did come down and give us a clearance or gave us a clear bill of health on the new Bluff Elementary School. Um, speaking with Trihurst Construction, um, August 10th is the estimated entrance date when we would begin to allow teachers to start moving their materials and supplies in. We've already started to receive the equipment and started to set up some of the different mill work as well as desks and tables and chairs, um, as well as the cafeteria tables in that new school. And we're going to be working with the administration and Bluff on finalizing a date to do their end of school surplus sale, if you will, so that we can hopefully remove um, the items that won't be necessary, won't be needed, and utilize that money towards the new school and the type of equipment or supplies they would need for the new building. I'd like to ask a question, maybe seek a little direction from the board and probably direct my question at Lucille and Nelson. Um, you know, we plan on having a big ribbon cutting at some point with, with Bluff Elementary, and we figured that in staying in consistent with our schedule from our other two new recently built buildings, I'm gonna pull this down, um, that we'd, we'd move into the month of September, but with COVID this year, that's certainly not gonna be the most ideal time to do that. And so my question is, knowing that we've done a traditional blessing, we've had a, a uh, quite a, a little ceremony with a ribbon cutting. Would it be would it be better to have a smaller group that could be controlled under the current situation and do a traditional blessing and have that conducted before um, early into this building, or should we let this whole 
the whole situation right out until we can bring a bigger group together, which could be, I mean, we may, we may be in this present situation all through fall semester. So we could be looking at even in the spring having a ribbon cutting on Bluff Elementary based, or even later, I, I can't pr project. So I'm just looking for a little guidance as to whether you think that would be appropriate what one way or the other to move forward. Should we, should we try to do the traditional blessing and do it under a small controlled measure? And then we can later, when we bring everybody together, we can do the, the more traditional or the, um, the ribbon cutting similar to what we've done with other buildings? Or how we, or we do we just wait and do them all, both of them together? What would you? Think, um, my recommendation would be just the small group before moving in. So we, we take care of that early. Nelson, did you hear that? Yeah, I, I, I would suggest a, a small group um, to, control, to control people and probably for the safety of everybody, uh, keeping, keeping it minimal for the Navajo uh, traditional blessing again. As for just a general uh, Ribbon cutting ceremony, we can do that in the springtime. Okay. okay. I appreciate that direction. I will work individually um, and, okay. and make some steps to move forward. Perfect. Thank you. Um, can I ask real quick? If I remember right, the district doesn't pay for the traditional blessing. Remind me where the money comes from for that? In the past, we've been able to. Um, receive donations or work with certain organizations that have donated the money for those that we put towards that. And that'll be our plan again. Okay, thank you. Just Perfect. Thank you. Oh, one second. Um, we have a new traditional practitioner at the Health System. It's kind of to get So maybe we could turn right there. Yeah. Okay. And, and we have, that's where generally we have worked really closely with is Utah Navajo Health they've been able to provide a lot of support in that area. So we'll continue to work. Thank you. Thanks, Superintendent. Uh, just an update on the Montezuma Creek Gym. As of now, August 3rd is the potential um, finalization date as far as getting the floor installed. The floor installers should be here by August 3rd to start installing the wooden floor, after which the bleachers would be installed, and then that building would also be um, substantially complete. So we're hoping by mid part to end part of August to have that gym entirely done. Um, that is all I had for, for capital projects. We're currently working on the 10 year, 15 year capital plan. I'll bring that back to the board for discussion and evaluation at a further point. Um, tracks. So we have proper signage for use and all the schools have been notified that we know vehicles. So we're working right now to get new signage that will be put up in all locations. Um, we're also working right now to get bids for Monticello. Um, we've already seen that there's people that are taking advantage of the paved asphalt to go ride bikes and scooters. Right. So we, we will have new signs. Um, I'm working right now with legal, the consultation on the possibility of putting anywhere for up to a $200 fine for anybody that's found trespassing or utilizing the track inappropriately and how that would hold up or what our, what our options there are. So I am working on trying to make sure the language is appropriate there so we can address that if we do have issues with it. And the schools obviously know I mean, we're not going to have homecoming, the cars on the track. We've had that discussion, at least with Monument Valley and White Horse, and that'll be reiterated again as we get those signs put up so that there's clear distinction. Now, the track company has communicated that in no way, shape, or form does the side-by-side, -side, actually, there are vehicles that do drive on tracks throughout the state. That doesn't void the warranty or diminish the warranty if it's not done in a, obviously, an inappropriate way because they understand that those types of events do happen. But there is a lot of the school districts that are moving towards after speaking with other business administrators towards a side by side or a different type of mobile that's actually driven on the grass as opposed to being driven on the track but we'll continue to emphasize that on the school level so that those are utilized for the purpose under which they're supposed to be used okay any, any questions comments okay uh the COVID 19 re-entry fund superintendent i'll set my timer <laughs> that's a timer it's getting set um no, this is, this is uh, we're excited to bring this plan forward. A tremendous amount of work has gone into this plan and from, you wouldn't believe how many different directions. I'm in awe of the many d different directions that have come to help us construct this plan. 
you know, this COVID-19 um, pandemic, when you get inside, it, it's everywhere. There's, there, there's a lot of angst, there's a lot of unsettlement. And when you look inside the district particularly, there's no department, there's no area, no group that doesn't have a very um, keen interest on where we're going and what's gonna happen because they have great concerns, whether it be transportation, maintenance, uh, instruction, administration, it doesn't matter where you turn, there's a lot of concerns. So we're excited to bring the plan. I am gonna have Julie and Kristen help me with presenting this. Um, our, yeah, if, if we're gonna, I, we have a camera and I know there's a lot of parents, so we're gonna maybe do something a little different to try to um, work within what we have set up for the parents and, and streaming this live. So Julie and Christy, I'm gonna have you actually come we're up this way. Maybe just slide back a little bit, but. Um, so anyway, I just wanna say thank you to all the district employees, the parents, everyone that's weighed in. In fact, that's that's the first thing I'd like to point out about our plan, is that well, why don't one of you come on this side? And we'll just do that. Um, Mary, you, you, yeah, you can just sit right there if you want, or you can just pull your chair back over here. Anyway. So let me just point out that many voices have, have gone into this plan. We've tried to reach out. We've tried to be collaborative. Uh, we surveyed our staff, our parents, our students. We got some students that gave us some input. Uh, we've taken direction from the Navajo Nation, the state of Utah, the local health departments. We've met with the local health department. Our plan has been gone through a process with Mr. Benj, um, and he has looked it over and provided some insight and some, some input into our plan. Um, and we've been excited about that. And we've also met with the, the San Juan Education Association. So we've, we've met with teachers and shared it in that regard. We felt like a lot of voices have gone in. We want you to please keep in mind this plan is fluid. The whole situation is very fluid. Um, you know, we're gonna have to be nimble and, and flexible to adjust on the fly with some things. There's, uh, you know, we even adjusted here a week ago with the governor's announcement. The governor's announcement, there's some things written into this plan that would have been written in differently without that announcement. And what announcement might come next week or, or whenever? We, we'll, we'll need to be ready to be flexible and ready to be proactive in meeting those demands. Um, we, you know, the, the one directive we're working under from the board is you have, as a board have asked us to, to be in compliance with the Navajo Nation, the health department of the Navajo Nation, the local health department of the state of Utah. So everything in this plan is gonna continue to try to meet, stay within compliance of those directives as well. And so again, if those directives change, we'll try to be flexible and meet that. Um, you will see on here, um, on, if, you've, if you've looked, this was actually a, a last addition on here, but I want you to know that our plans include building protocols and precautions that will be taken at the school and at the district level. These protocols will give our administrators, our teachers, actual instructions and, and training and knowledge of what to happen in what case. So should we have a student that tests positive? Should we have a student that, that displays uh, symptoms or, or says they're ill? What should happen exactly and what, what action should take place so that we're all on the same page and we're working together? And we're building those protocols and those protocols will cover everything from the classroom to what happens with buses, what happens with transportation, um, what happens in the area with our staff and, and what's, how does those protocols align with the legal uh, litigations that have been passed and, and that are in place. So um, we're working on those and, and you have a draft form of where we stand with those. Some of those are still being finalized. The protocols will still be continue to be finalized and they'll be at the school level. Um, you know, one of the major concerns that we've worked with with this plan and we've looked at early and we've really tried to do a lot with, and, and I'll just mention it and then I know in some parts of our presentation we'll go a little deeper, but we are very concerned about what this might mean for an increased workload for our administrative teacher and staff workload. We realize when we, when we get inside this plan and you look at it, we do, we do have concern to what we might be asking our staff across the district to do. And we will talk about some, some proactive steps we've taken and some things that we think will help 
certainly be supportive in these areas, but just be aware that that is a major concern that as we go forward. And also the last thing I want to really point out that's important with this, with this plan is that this plan is written on kind of an umbrella kind of format, a little higher level. There's a lot of detail that still will be crafted in these plans. It still has to go down to the school level. And parents and staff and, and those at the school level, administration, has to still t get very detailed. If we're talking about kids will move in a, in a logical sense to avoid a lot of back and forth, well, what does that mean in this school? And we're not trying to tell 12 schools in one plan to parents because they're interested in what does it mean for their child's school. And so there still will be a need for schools to attach some information. We'll give the directive, we've got the structure in place, the bones are in place, but be aware that there's still a lot of input that will come at the teacher level, the, the administrative level, the, the school level in these plans. So with that said, I'd like to just move through. We, we hope, and if, if this plan is approved tonight, we hope to make this public as, as early as even later tonight to be on the website. We do have a plan that this will be mailed to every single parent in the district. And we have a plan that that will, will start to flow as early as tomorrow. So our goal here tonight is hopefully to take any input from the board, follow your direction, and then make those corrections and move quickly to get this plan going forward because as I said, there's some steps that need to happen at the school level and at the parent level that time is of essence. So we're going to move quickly on that. But, so I, the cover letter, maybe we just go quickly to the cover letter. There's a cover letter that will be included um, that would start with the, the plan and it would be a letter for me as the superintendent and I would express my enthusiasm for the school year. I still believe we're going to have a great year. Um, we're going to make this one of the greatest years ever and I believe with the right attitude we can do that. And then in the next paragraph, I'll move down and we'll just talk about what this plan might mean and, the, and some of the, the, just kind of the things I just shared with you, the, the overall view of the plan and, and ask parents to read the plan carefully and point out that if they have concerns or questions, please contact your local school. So that, that would be the first page. And then would, this plan, as I said, another major part of this plan is based on teacher I mean, excuse me, parent choice. And so this next document would, we go to the models of instruction, would start to explain to the parent that there is choice. There's flexibility here. We know that we have parents and staff members that are everywhere. When we took our survey, we found we have them everywhere from, we need to get back in school and there's, uh, frankly, we need to just get back to normal all the way over here to, um, I don't know if I feel comfortable even going out in public right now. And it was everywhere in between. And, the, and ironically, it can change with events in everyone's life. So something in one day could literally make things change. So our survey, in my opinion, is a little bit even outdated now. It's two to three weeks old. And so things are constantly changing. But this model is based on parent choice to provide some flexibility where they might even go back and forth a little, parents may, even in the next few weeks or even in the beginning of the school year, even in, in the fall quarter, we might see some parents that are feeling one way or the other. But I'm going to explain option one. Option one for a parent to choose would be face-to-face -face learning, and that option is where we would try to get as close to normal. I'll, I'll say we're, we're never going back to normal. There's a lot of things that are going to be changed long term, but that would be the traditional face-to-face -face in the classroom learning um, with all the precautions that will be explained in the back of this packet in the additional papers in place. So schools will have protocols and precautions in place and if a child comes to school following those precautions and receives their instruction face-to-face -face in classroom and that's where the parent feels that child is best supported, option one would be their choice. I'll have Christy speak to option two and then Julie will speak to option three. All right, so option two is really a blended virtual learning experience and really this is the flexible option. You know, and as we designed option two, we really kept in mind the San Juan Quest model because that drives everything that we do in San Juan School District. So as a parent, as teachers and staff, 
um, as a community as we consider which option best continues the work that we do in San Mateo School District. Option two really um, was designed for that purpose. With this blended learning model, there's flexibility to move in and out of the classroom. So this model could work for a student who decides not to come back to school at the beginning of the school year and then eventually returns to the classroom. It aligns the instruction in the classroom with at-home learning so the student does not get off track with the rest of the class. So this learning model um, takes Canvas, our Canvas platform, which we'll be using in all of our classrooms, and allows for a student to be able to show up the first day and learn with their class. It could be that um, the second week of school, they now have to be quarantined. They're still learning with their class on pace. They come back to the classroom. They're still in that learning on, on pace with their, their peers in their classroom. This um, model also aligns the student to a San Juan School District teacher, and that teacher will provide the support and the integration into the school environment. So with this model, a student still is connected to their home school. They have a classroom teacher who is going to follow up with them, who's gonna provide additional supports, um, possible online learning classroom. Um, they will do, you know, work with the parent as well. You run into any issues in this model, the teacher is assigned to that student and will work with them just like they would if the student shows up in person. Um, as part of this model, um, we have, are in the process, we have amazing San Juan School District teachers who are using their summer vacation to help develop Canvas courses that will be very similar in nature. So we took in all that parent feedback of the challenges of fourth quarter when we had to instantly have something for students, and now we have something that is designed to really look at what are the most essential um, elements that need to be in an online learning course. That course will be used in the classroom for students who are there in person, as well as for the students that are at home. And those courses are being designed, so if a classroom teacher is an expert in Canvas, they can add and tweak it and make it better, but any teacher, even if they don't have Canvas experience, can come in the first day of school and that um, model, modules are already set up and it's ready to go and it's been simplified so for parents, if I have a third grade student and a sixth grade student, when I get in to look at the online learning platform with this model, I would see the same thing and be able to support my student in the same way. So it's really provided a model that makes it easier for parents, easier for students, and easier for teachers, which is really our goal um, with this model. Um, this also could be considered when we're thinking about school specific, um, school specific decisions that might come up. So we know it is possible that we could have some of our schools come back 100% online. Um, and in thinking about that, this model will work for that. Um, it's already ready to go, so if that decision is made at some point in time that some of our schools are required to do that, this model will work perfectly. It also allows for a school to say, oh, we've got this high, high number of students that are coming back, and our parents are concerned about having that many students in the school at a time. It gives some flexibility for an individual school site to make decisions that are specific to that school site. Um, so I think that's another option that, that makes it, it a really fabulous option for each of our schools to be really in, individualized and differentiated for learning. Um, let's see if I wanted to share anything else that you probably need to know. Um, as part of this, we will have a disclosure statement as part of each of those classrooms that will include the digital component and expectations. As part of registration, parents will also sign assurance because when they're at home learning, they are a mentor for their student, um, but they still have the teacher support. We do recognize that from fourth quarter, it was really challenging for teachers. Um, and we want, with this model, we have a couple of different ideas, we're working on different ideas based upon the data that we receive from registration to support teachers. We recognize a teacher can't teach in classroom all day long and then try to support digital learning. So based upon our registration and what options teachers, I mean, excuse me, parents choose, we will work with schools to create a schedule that allows online learning teacher instruction um, that is in addition to just classroom instruction. So there would be something built into this model that would support teachers so they're not feeling like they have to do both and they don't have the time to do that. Um, I'll just touch on the, can I talked a little bit about the Canvas project that's being developed. Um, I do want to make sure that you're aware that the Canvas project also includes heritage language. So we will offer heritage language courses for all of our students that would like to enroll in that, that course. So in elementary, they would be in their normal classroom, but they also would be in heritage language as they choose. And then in secondary, that is like all of our other um, classes in secondary they can enroll in. I think that's a really important um, point to make with this because that really al aligns with the needs of our students and um, not, not losing out on what is really core curriculum for our students in San Juan School District. 
Okay. So our third and final option um, for learning will be the virtual online. So it's completely online. Um, and this would be aside from San Juan School District curriculum. So a couple of important things went into the uh, deciding factors for this model. One is that we provide curriculum that is sound curriculum that is aligned with state state core standards. Um, and, that, and the other is that it, we can keep our students in our district. So um, students that enroll outside of San Juan School District programs so they're not recognized by San Juan School District, um, we, the district does lose the WPU or a portion of the WPU for those courses. So if we, so we looked very carefully at what programs could we look at that are sound, that have um, comprehensive platforms that we could offer parents. So um, with the blended model um, that Christy was mentioning, there is a learning coach component um, built into that, being that that would be a parent or some adult that would be working with the child side by side with the classroom teacher. With the virtual online independent option, that person becomes, it, it doesn't have the connection to San Juan School District in the elementary schools. There's a possible connection in the secondary schools depending on the content area. Um, but the learning coach really becomes the parent. So that, with the online virtual, they, we have two, pro, two um, programs that we're gonna be offering. We'll be using Schools PLP for kindergarten through fifth or sixth. We actually can go through eighth if we need to with some of those courses. And then we have um, Edgenuity that we'll be using for the high school co courses for core, and we can also offer elective and CTE courses that way. Um, th but then again, the, the parent or um, they will have to have some learning coach that is, that is working side by side with them in charge of their success, in charge of their monitoring. They will be linked to a teacher um, within those courses that is outside of San Juan School District for elementary most likely and in and possibly for our, most likely for our core teachers at the high school um, we will have a teacher record so that could be um, one or two depending on registration and what the numbers come out to be we could have one or two or three or maybe one at one one uh, teacher at each site that oversees the grading and support and monitoring of those students um, but that is completely it the courses are completely built online and it's it's monitored by the parent and by the online teacher, not our San Juan School District teachers that will be doing the blended learning piece. So, um, that's pretty much. No cost. It's no oh yeah, it's no cost. That, no this cost option is no cost to students. So, if if a parent chooses to do this because it's within the district, it will um, it will be no cost to to students at all or parents. No cost to parents. Yeah. So we've tried to build these three options with a lot of flexibility with, for parent choice. Um, and, and as I've tried to look through the eyes of a parent and see these, certainly I think if I had a child that I felt was ready, felt comfortable about going back to school, option one is, is the option that I would choose. Um, if, I, if I did not feel comfortable yet at this point, but I still wanted my child to be connected to the school curriculum, have an assigned teacher from the school district, and have the possibility of back and forth far more flexible than option two is definitely the option. And that's what we'll use if in the cases of quarantine and those kind of things, option two will provide that flexibility to us. And if I have a child that I know long-term, I'm not gonna feel comfortable about returning to the class. I, feel, I do feel comfortable about placing them into a commercial, personalized learning curriculum that is provided at no cost and I know that that's going to be an indefinite for amount of time decision, then option three could be, would be the right decision. In all cases, there is some attachment to the district. They're enrolled under our student body. And we will support all those to some level. Options one and two definitely receive the highest level of support. We still support option three. We still have to enroll them. We have to provide the curriculum. We have to work but that curriculum is really designed at a self-learning pace and a self-individualized uh, module. So, but we believe we're gonna provide a lot of flexibility and a lot of choice in here. I do wanna point out a couple of things. If we go back to the top of this document right here, we are talking about an online registration starting on July 27th and running through July 31st. That's very, very quickly. But that we do want, we wanna have it as early as we can and get as accurate as data as we can because that data is going to drive a lot of decisions. Once we see where parents are at at this moment, 
We'd like to do it as late as we can too, actually, but we need some time in between. So we really feel this is about the appropriate time to hold this online registration. And we wondered about one week. Was one week long enough? But we did find there's a lot of concern about this topic in our district. When we threw out our survey, we got data back at a rate we had never seen before. In one week, we had over 800 responses. I don't know if we've ever had a survey that I've seen that's even been close in that type of a return. And we got it in one week. Now, within two weeks, we had more than 800. But we need to get enough data in to start driving some of the decisions we will make. As we, as we refer to, as Christy spoke about, how many are in option two, how many are in option three, how many are in option one, will lead us to some decisions at the district and school level. When you talk about personalizing it at the school level, that data is going to be very important to start realizing um, how we might want to go about structuring even at the staff level and some of those things. We are prepared if necessary, and Christy again referred to this, to look at altering our schedule, our daily time schedule, and to find ways to provide more professional development, more prep time, more time to deal, to, to handle the, ex, the um, extra um, workload and the extra expectations. But the data will drive the final decisions there. We really need to see what we're getting. Um, and, then, and then we'll have a better idea of exactly the right decisions to make. And then I, down towards the bottom, you're going all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom, I want to make sure that you're aware we have provided a Navajo translation, and I'm excited about this. Um, we, we've realized that there's some things we can do that I think will be helpful. Um, now in this case, it's going to be on a written, the parents are going to receive this document on a paper format, and by using a QR code reading, and I actually wouldn't mind trying this. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Boy, if you want to talk about taking this gamble, <laughs> it worked last maybe night. not being very smart. <laughs> You're not going to be able to hear this, I don't think. But. Yeah. <laughs> Every, every um, page that we have in our packet is translated into the, the Navajo, to Diné language, and so we're excited about that. Now, we do know that not every phone has a QR reader. They are free. We're gonna, and we also know that some of our teachers have already started using uh, QR code uh, readers, uh, codes. I, I know of a kindergarten class in Montezuma Creek that had the little kindergartners reading a book and they took a picture of it, put a QR code on it, sent it home. So it is somewhat in our district already, but we'll have to improve on that. Now, if it's a digital copy, we're gonna try to just put little arrows to start it, but we'd also like to just be able to mail things and have them translated. And I would, I would highlight the work of Brenda Whitehorse and, and Aaron, the tech department, for pulling that project off. And we're get, we learned a lot, and I think we'll be better at doing it in the future. But we've tried to make sure our parents are connected. There's a lot of information here, and this is a really big decision. This, this is a decision parents have to make. So we've tried to give them the information they need to hopefully make the, the best decision they feel comfortable with. So, and then the last thing I want to go back to is registration. The tech department um, is, is working on a very parent-friendly registration, online registration. And I was able to view that today, and I'm excited about it. It will be, I think, very smooth. It will walk the parents right through uh, a few questions of where they're at. It'll, ask, it'll give them some information like this, and then it'll have them choose where they feel most comfortable to place their child. If they, cho if they choose option one or option two, it'll actually move them right into Aspire, and they'll walk all the way through the, tran uh, the registration process. If they choose option three, a pop-up screen will come up and say, you will be contacted by a school counselor or administrator. And so we'll need to take that information, work with the schools, and because that involves being registered into a commercial program, which is much more complicated as far as just an online registration process. But we'll let them know that they will be contacted. So we think that process will be, it, it, we've tried it on smartphones, we've tried it, and it seems to be very smooth and very uh, parent friendly, and we're excited about that. So that's how that whole registration process will play out. Um, Superintendent, you might want to 
might want to mention that they'll have to do it for each of their children. Yes, so if they, yes, they do. To register, they have to register each child so that if they have four in the system, they would go through it four times um, because it does require an individual registration for each child. But I think they're used to that. I think that's not new. That's been something that's been in place. So if we go down to the, so we, we go beyond this document, now go into the, then we'll start looking at the precautions that we have in place. And that would be, that's the one with, with all. At the bottom, no, information. Yeah, right. the parent is it, information. Is it the parent um, information yep, packet? Yep. Is, that the one uh, is it the one with the pictures? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. So then this would be the third page of the parent packet and it would start to really be explicit at, as, and give the parents the information they need again to help them decide between those three options. Knowing what's happening in the schools I think is very helpful to know if you do feel comfortable with your child returning to school or not. And so this is very critical and we're trying to provide the parents with this information. Um, and again they are being translated into our Navajo language but um, so we just walked down we start with asking the parent to be a partner and we've we've continued to partner with our parents and try to develop a strong homeschool relationship but we do ask our parents to understand that they will take their their students um, temperature daily again our, our 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 task force our directors the committee that we work through we looked at a lot of things thinking maybe we would check temperatures at school for every child or before they got on the bus Actually, the latest recommendations of schools are not calling for that. They're still calling for the parents to check temperature. Any, there's too many variables involved when kids are rushing to a place or whether they've been running, whether they haven't. Um, you can also create a bottleneck. There's for a number of reasons why so it still is being recommended that the parents check the temperature and we ask them to look for symptoms and keep them home if they're displaying any symptoms. And certainly a big part of our plan is for staff and students to know if you're if you're sick in any way that you would stay home we we have um, we are definitely and so then we also have be positive proactive in your conversations your child's school will be sending correspondence so we're trying to make sure our parents know that the school will still be working with them with more specific guidelines or more specific information and uh, then the next page I don't know that I want to read all these board you've had this I, I'd probably like to just kind of highlight a few things and see if you have any questions um, but then yeah this page is is important because we do let parents know that we we are planning on providing two or more gators that are personalized with their name on them similar to this but with school colors and I uh, and uh, and they'd be able to, you know, these we were hoping are a little more convenient up and down, and but they'd also be able to wear any face covering of their choice. So these would not be re the required face covering. These would be just issued as options. And and it, it, when we in all the areas that we say we will wear face coverings, these would be this would be an option or any other face covering. So we try to give the parents the idea of what we're doing there. Um, and then I, I guess, unless there's any questions or concerns with that, I'm going to move down to the next page. Can we go on to the right. I have a question and concern. So as I've seen people um, who wear masks, and especially if they're talking at all, I was in a meeting yesterday where everyone had a mask on, and every time somebody start, started talking, they were also bringing the mask back up, bringing the mask back up. I, we were social distanced enough that I was the only one who didn't have a mask, but I observed all the hands up here when a mask was on. So if you're wearing a mask and touching it a lot, and it comes down here, then those germs aren't being placed on a desk that somebody might touch and those kinds of things. So I like the idea of having a mask that doesn't then, be, you know, you breathe on it, cough on it, set it down. Put it back on. I <laughs> cough on it. Set it down. I, I like the idea that if students are going to have, you know, young kids are going to have masks on, that they stay on their body instead of get, you know, set down <coughs> all over the classroom. Yeah. Well, these would stay on their neck. 
So that's there, there is still touching. Choice. There is still touching a lot. But, if they um, choice, but we will be washing hands frequently uh, with hand sanitizer. Um, yes. If they, have a, if they have a choice to bring one from home, then they're going to go on and off and on and off. And anything that's up here is literally spreading your germs to a surface if it's placed down. I think that's the best way to spread germs in a school is to wear a mask and set it down. And wear a mask and set it down. And um, I don't know if I saw, you know, hand sanitizers at their desk only. Washing hands is preferable, I think, to hand sanitizer, but a box of Kleenex at every student's desk. But then that's got to go straight in the trash. We wouldn't recommend that somebody hold a Kleenex up here and then keep it all day back and forth and back and forth. That would be the same as. So, anyway, that's my concern are masks being set down ever. You know, even um, if you saw Governor Herbert's. Uh, press conference today, he did mention, and I agree with him, that that he def he stood by his declaration that they will be required in schools, but he was very clear to say there are reasonable times when educators and students, the masks will not be worn. He says within the educational system, I mean, I don't think if a teacher, like I have lowered mine right now, there may be times that a teacher has to lower their mask to even have their their mouth physically physically seen um, there's just a number of issues it, we in this plan require masks by staff and students in no, in most places in the school but we recognize there's a sense of being logical and being practical that there might be some exceptions to that requirement and we will work with administration to really try to find those lines and those balances that are effective but um, so any younger kids, there might be some discussions there and some of those things, and as Governor Herbert even referred to that today in his press conference, but we definitely have a requirement of masks for staff and students in the building. So. Excuse me, I'm off. <clears throat> Councilman Lehi from New Mountain Tribe, Tribal Rep for White Mesa. <clears throat> I've got some issues here with um, what you're talking about. He's going to have to put yeah. a comment. Um, Sir, yeah. We're gonna need to. Um, if I can have you hold off, we have a public comment period for this. So this is just the presentation because if we let it get out with the public comment, then we can't control the presentation. So we're going to ask you to wait until 6 o'clock if you can. Okay. And then just write it down, then we'll give you that opportunity to speak. Is that all right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So anyway, that's that's kind of our face coverings and, and what we're looking to do there. We are looking to make to meet the requirement of the governor at this point. So if you want to go to the next. Then we move into the classroom environment. Um, again, uh, we're talking a lot about increased sanitizing. We're, we're talking about our uh, face coverings again, um, physical distancing. We will look at our rooms if there's uh, if there's furniture that is um, not being used, it's not very effectively used, that could be removed to open up more space to social distance. We are going to cover our entire district and look at it through that lens to see if that can be provided. Um, and, and we're looking at, you know, we will be issuing technology. We'll have a protocol of how to issue that, how to clean the technology. We're not going to be sharing supplies, materials. Um, any other major concerns with any of this we will have a protocol to work with san juan health in the event that there's an illness or an outbreak or a potential positive case we will work immediately with the health department and a protocol will be in place it's it's in the late stages of even being developed now that will guide exactly what will happen how or when or who which parents, which staff, which individuals would be contacted. That will all be part of the protocol. In the event of a possible school shutdown, uh, the health department would play a major role in that as well through this investigative uh, protocol. They would, they would work through that issue with us. And those things are all being developed. Um, so any questions or concerns with anything on the classroom? For the board. For the board. Mary? No, for you, no. Okay. okay, moving to the, you know, that we talk. You? No. We, no. Okay. we do recognize that there's some higher risk curriculum areas, courses, 
and you know we will again take steps to you know the, the we've been given recommendations by the state and precautions and we will take those precautions and those steps such, such things as PE and choir um, not PE, choir and uh, band could be held in an auditorium setting and could be socially distanced um, they will not be held in a small room of any kind where social distancing cannot happen we'll look at PE and, and what's happening in those areas but we'll take precautions as well there we are looking at plexiglass plexiglass uh, barriers for both our front line secretaries or admin assistants in the front of the building and also our SPED staff where appropriate and directors are, are, are uh, directing us on how and where they feel those need to be in place and so we're following all those guidelines as well um, our related services we're, we're looking at what we need to do in those areas as well and, and following precautions. Any questions on this page? Nelson? Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So transitions, restrooms, transitions, certainly face coverings will be utilized. Um, extra cleaning, we expect to have uh, signage in the halls. We're looking at the school level of of directional movement, which way should students move? Uh, we believe we can streamline some of that to be more effective in, in not having so much back and forth and passing in the hallways. So that's all being talked about. That's a lot of the information that's being personalized at the school level because every school has a little different configuration. Um, and so we're looking at those things of how those will happen. Restrooms, we will be talking about how to avoid um, multiple large number of students using the restroom facilities at the same time how to control the numbers there we will look into things like even um, blocking off certain urinals or certain uh, bathroom stalls to ensure that we maintain social distancing and uh, those kind of things will be in place as well we will also designate restrooms for certain hallways certain classway classes so again, that we can control those factors a little bit better. So, any questions? Uh, lunchtime, recess, again, these are very tricky times, but we do believe that we still can put some things in place that will be helpful. And uh, in, in the event of an investigation, if, if anything happens, it's gonna be very helpful to be able to work with the health department with knowing uh, how students interacted with one another. I think we will see seating charts in the lunchrooms. We'll look at the schedule of how classes rotate in there. Some schools, again, have more ability to work that than others. Blanding Elementary, for instance, has a lot of classes that rotate through that lunchroom. And how we might, you know, what we might can do in some of those areas is going to be more flexible in some schools than others. But we're going to look it over as a whole and try to make sure we're, we're putting things in place. We will use outdoor eating areas as much as possible. There's only a few facilities that have resources in that way, but if we can. Um, again, students will wear face coverings in the cafeteria only as appropriate. That's probably a place where, again, logically, you're not gonna see face coverings to the extent you would see in the halls, for instance. Um, recess, again, we will limit the number out to recess. We still believe very strongly recess is important. Um, we're not removing recess, but we will try to structure it in a way that we control the numbers and somewhat control what happens there. Um, we'll, we'll establish schedules and, and, and um, look at that way. Um, and we're also going to enhance our cleaning of our playground equipment, our cafeteria equipment, all that again. And all through the school, the enhanced cleaning will be done. We, we have the... Uh, maintenance department looking at what it's going to take to enhance these cleaning efforts throughout the entire district knowing that there again there are CDC recommendations of what should happen what should be cleaned and how frequently and so we're going to follow those things any questions yeah so with the cleaning of the equipment and all the cleaning I mean we see the janitors busy all yes. day anyway how are we going to handle that capacity with who we have good question but we've needed we will hire support help 
We, we have not ruled out the fact that we may have to hire in some places support help. Right now we're at the stage where we have departments looking over what's expected of them and reporting back, can they meet this need or do they need additional help? You know, we, we have been given $710,000 for care money and I can tell you we are not going to struggle spending it. It's going to go fast and we're going to probably be concerned about finances on, on the other side of that. Um, but yeah, th those are the kind of things that we are definitely um, on the table as possibilities. I mean, is it something too that even with, say we had Clorox wipes, that the, the teachers and kids can be proactive in doing some of it themselves? We've talked about that, and that's been an idea, and we haven't made that final decision, but we've talked about possibly, yeah, could every desk be wiped by the student as they leave and they drop the Clorox wipe. And yeah, we, we will explore those further, but we do know those desks are going to be clean between periods. Sure. Okay. I know the superintendent, I know at least on the custodial level, there's been discussion and talk about more focused cleaning, focusing on more of those high touch areas, as opposed to maybe some of the general sweeping that may take place during the during the regular work day, as opposed to having that done when the students are gone, but focusing on those high touch areas during yep, the day. During the day, multiple cleanings of the high touch area. Mm -hmm. yep. <coughs> Okay. Oh wait, Nelson, go ahead. What about um, how about just maybe some lighting? The uh, blue light, or what were they really called? UV lights. UV lights. Oh yes. UV yeah. lights. So, I can speak to that if you want. In the, go ahead. In the classroom. Yeah. So, Nelson, one of the challenges that we've run into is is we've actually worked with one of the local businesses here, um, Eagle Air Med, Mr. Ewald is in charge of the cleaning of the airplanes when they use those for life flights and we visited with him I went and spent some time with him to evaluate their processes and what they use as far as those UV lights That's one of the areas and I've also reached out to the state uh, purchasing office because they provided PPE equipment lists of updated companies that are participating in those state um, proprietary agreements and one of the challenges that they're running into is there is not a manufacturer right now that they've had luck with in, in establishing a contract with state purchasing to make those lights, if you will, even rationally affordable. Um, some of the lights that are installed on those airplanes have almost quadrupled in price. And for a small light that would light an area anywhere from 10 to 12 feet has gone from a $750 cost per light to almost a $5,000 cost per light and they're not able to find the replacement bulbs for those UV type um, bacteria killing options. So we're still looking into that. That is something that's a current discussion, at least on the state level. Um, those have, found, have been found to be super effective, but again, the cost factor is something that's um, debilitating the opportunity for schools to access those types of lights to use for these kinds of circumstances. But we are keeping tabs on, on that progression as it moves through the state. Okay. Thank you. So we go to the next page. I think it's trans. Nope. It's in and out of the building. You know that? Oh my gosh. It's been pretty. You know, this next page has to do with in and out. And I want, you know, these were some decisions that were made. Uh, you know, we greatly value our volunteers in the classroom and in our schools, but we have made a decision during this time to suspend volunteers in the classroom and the schools just because it it just leaves things so wide open and difficult to have any kind of a controlled environment and so we've looked at that and just felt that's what needed to happen um, uh, so just be aware that that's a decision that is written into here that that um, I want the board to make sure they don't overlook and again then we talk about uh, multiple entrances will be designated for drop-off and pickup you will see at most schools we generally, in, in previous years, everyone meets at usually one foyer and there's quite a group. We want to start to control that. We will designate certain grade levels might go to this exit. And you know, that changes some of the things we've done in the past where we've always controlled one access in and out of the building for safety. So it depends on what's the greatest threat. And right now, COVID is the greatest threat. So there's logic behind opening up multiple entrances into the building. and designating them and keeping our groups smaller and more controlled in and out of the building. So you'll see schools that will be trying to do that and work through that. Um, we'll have sanitizer at, at our entry and our exit locations. We'll have signage that will be there that will 
uh, you know, have um, make sure that they alert anyone entering the building if they enter with any kind of symptoms to do not enter. Um, and we'll probably have signage that will indicate this is a mask only um, building to, to enter. Um, Anyway, so then that's kind of the in and out of our building. Any questions, board members? So once we go in or out, do the, are we gonna lock those doors again? Yes, they Please would still yes. be secure during the school day, just like they normally would be. So the next page is transportation. And transportation is another very tricky area. You know, we wanna look and see what our data says. Um, we, we, our survey data, if it's still current, gives us a strong indication that, that we will have, you know, where we, where we bus most of our students is in our river region, and that we would have a, a, a high percentage of those students, according to the survey, may start under option two, virtual learning at home, or, vir or option three. We did get a, a probably 63 to 65% of parents in our river region said they feel comfortable with their child starting at home. And in that case, we may not see large numbers on our buses right off the beginning. But large numbers on our buses, it's very difficult to social distance if those buses are full, which they have been in previous years. Uh, we do know we will mandate masks. We do know that our bus driver will take some precautions to keep our staff members safe on there and work with under the guidelines that will be allowed by the state for our bus driver. But once we have the data, we'll have a better idea of what's looking at on our buses. We do foresee that we, if we do group students, um, we will group them by families. Um, and so we could put families in a closer proximity. If we do have um, the ability to social distance, we can keep families grouped together, which opens up a little bit of flexibility. Um, but we'll look at all of those things as we get that data and as we could see. Now, I know there's some parents that are concerned with buses. I've received some emails and some information and there is a chance that if, if a large enough group of parents feel like you know I'm all, I only want my child to ride the bus half time every other day or something again that option two provides some flexibility for some of that type of behavior to happen where they we where if they're only on there half the time and a school uh, uh, works a, a plan around that you could have only half the kids that would normally be on that bus on that bus at any one time but we just need to see the data to really get the best feel of how to do this. What we know right now is students and staff will wear masks. We will do our best to social distance, knowing that if the bus is full, that's very difficult. This also includes extracurricular activities, you know, transportation, same thing applies. And while we don't even know exactly what that's gonna look like, what we do know at this point is that our mountain region, Blandina and Monticello, are under the um, yellow designation and athletics are allowed and they are practicing anticipating the Utah High School Association has given every indication that there will be a season and so there we do at this point project they will be on buses and traveling at the present time our river region is still under red and so no sports are allowed under red so in our river region we're not sure what that's going to look like far reaching as, as well. But busing transportation is tricky, whether it be extracurricular or just transportation to and from school. So we'll put those precautions in place. Um, you know, we will sanitize our buses after every single run. They will be wiped down, seats will be wiped down. Again, we'll have a protocol for how that's handled. And even in the area of our cars that the staff travel in, we have, a, we have a lot of cars that are used daily in this district, and we'll have a protocol in place to sanitize those as well between use. So we'll, we'll carry it over even beyond that. Any questions on transportation? And then what about large group gatherings? Again, we've just made some decisions here. All person student body gatherings and assemblies will be suspended until further notice. Broadcasts may be provided. So your typical traditional uh, opening assembly where everyone goes to the auditorium, we're suspending those type of things right off the bat until further notice. You could do something over the intercom. Some, some schools have the ability to utilize TVs in some way. 
So there's some virtual things that could happen, but not. we just don't think we want to have any opportunity to get large groups together. Um, we are also saying all community events and parent meetings may be provided virtually, not to bring those groups into the building. Um, we'll follow all Utah High School Association guidelines and sponsored activities and sports. Um, and staff meetings should be also conducted virtually unless they can appropriately social distance. So we're putting that in, face, in place as well. And when they, when they are, if they do something face-to-face, -face, face coverings will be uh, required. So if they do elect to do something that way. Any questions or thoughts or concerns on that? Steve? Uh, I have one thing that... One sec, Nelson. Uh, Steve, and then I'll call on you. Okay. Uh, one thing that caught my attention was uh, for live performances on PE, or excuse me, on choir, art, and band, and so forth, they're suspended, period. But then for sports, we're following the guidelines of the UHSAA. Uh, in a lot of ways, the UHSAA. I'm having a hard time there, too. Yeah. Good point. It's and that, needs, that needs, needs to be fixed. And, and such. I, I would like to see them the same. Yep. Nelson? Anything that's co covered under UHSA, which some of choir and that is, would fall under you. That's a good catch. We need to clarify that. He was asking about um, why, like, live performances have restrictions versus sports. So we will follow up on that and see. If they all fall under the Utah High School Athletic Association, why it wouldn't be the same for both. Are you ready for your question? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, first question, under option three, maybe two as well, for school meals? For school meals. Meals. Are meals being provided? Um, we again will look at what our staff and our kitchen staff would we, we're looking at some possibilities there. It could be very difficult to cook a lunch and also provide to build a bunch of sandwiches and, and a to-go lunch and to figure out how to get it out there with the present staff. This, just cooking the lunch and getting it served. But if all of our school is virtual or a high, high majority, we could do that. That could continue just as it did in fourth quarter. But we haven't made a commitment as far as lunches until we see again the data, because we're not sure. We might could provide a, a, just a pick and pick up and go, grab and go kind of lunch, and we'll look at the best possibilities. We certainly want to try to provide meals to all of our students, but we we purposely held off a little again because if a school is around 50-50 and they have to feed 50% of their kids. That alone, when you cook that meal and clean up that meal, that's a lot. And then to make a whole nother lunch that can be, um, that's of the go type thing, uh, lunch, is very difficult on top of the hours that they're allocated. And those hours are allocated based on some legal requirements that are in place. And it's tough to, those legal requirements are very important. So there's a lot of variables weighing in. but. We are not, have, we, we definitely wanted to look at the data before we made commitments as to how the lunch would work. Okay, my second question, uh, transportation department, the bus drivers, will they, other than mask, will they have any other protections such as plexiglass or sleeve guards or anything? Okay, uh, again, the latest, uh, Plexiglass has been ruled out for bus drivers by the, I don't know the official organization, but the but the safety. UDOT. UDOT, uh, yes, probably UDOT. Uh, as I know, okay. the latest safety recommendations are not allowing for plexiglass for bus drivers. Um, even masks will be interesting to see if they'll allow a type of a face shield or not. Anything that has potential to block vision um, is definitely scrutinized pretty highly. What we know is we will definitely provide any PPE to our bus drivers that are within the guidelines. We are prepared to provide all approved guidelines of PPE. Okay, my next question. Uh, will 
facility use to the community be suspended until further notice as well? Yes, with yes, on a general sense, yes. I would say there could not be an exception. There's always a possibility of an exception, but it would have to go through a very high level approval process. On a, on a general sense, yes. We, we just feel like with the extra enhanced sanitizing and cleaning and all of that to bring in additional um, activities and individuals and to try to stay ahead of all that is really problematic at this time. Okay, my final question. Uh, it sounds to me like there's going to be some support staff in, in almost every department. Could you at some point give us a random number of how, much, how many people will need, like X amount of the transportation? Because if you're going to be walking bus every day and cleaning and whatnot, there at the bus barn is not able to handle that data, as well as for the kitchen and so forth. So, I would like to see some numbers at some point. Okay. Yes, as those as those decisions are finalized, we definitely be able to provide those numbers. We're still gathering right now from the directors of exactly what they think it'll take to to accomplish the the expectation. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Options two and three, it refers to. Can you to, talk louder so I'm not so clear? <laughs> on options two and three, it refers to the a mentor or a coach that the parent and or guardian is um, expected to do that. How can we ensure if somebody or that all parents who choose that option are committed to doing, to being that coach and that mentor and that work will be turned in, that those kinds of things will happen? And not only happen, but happen in a timely manner for the um, school staff that is taking care of that and you know doesn't want that student to be behind and they also don't want to be behind. That's been a big discussion. I don't and I don't know that we found the silver bullet to say exactly how. We have decided to put into the registration that I referred to that they would check a box and read through what is expected of them and sign an assurance that they understand what their role is and check that yes, they are willing to provide that support. Now past that, we're still gonna have some of the same, I think, concerns and, and questions because there's really no way to go out and police it past that. In my- uh, Can I make a comment? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah, so I was just gonna comment. This is, Families experience lots of different situations that impact the level of student learning for a student, and a lot of those situations cannot be you know, changed. So with that consideration, schools are already set up with a tiered system of support for students that are struggling in their school environment. So as part of option two, those support systems that are already in the school can be modified to continue to support students in that same way within the same systems that we already have set up in our schools. I think that's a little bit of the challenge for option three for parents is that Tiered system support is going to be really limited in option two, option three versus option two. So I don't know if that helps. I was, oh, go ahead, Do, do, do you want me to? Yeah, it's tagged onto that. Okay, and then we'll ask you. This okay. Thing. So I just wanted to mention that we have taken into consideration the support that's going to, additional support that's going to be needed for the teachers to make this happen. So we learned a lot last spring, and, we, and that's where we've talked about adding in some time that's specific to student support aside from teacher prep. So that we're looking at those options within our schedule so that we have an isolated block of time that teachers have set aside to support students, whether they have one to five online in their classroom or whether we have just one online teacher, whatever the scenario is, we're trying to build that into our into schedules for teachers so that, so that we can provide some additional support for them to reach out. Because we realized last spring that was huge and, and they just didn't have time to put their curriculum together and reach out and and so we really left a lot of that up to the parents, and I think it's got to go both ways to be effective. Um, it's got to be it's got to be a partnership. So, okay. so, so just a sec. Okay, on option two and option three, um, our parents down in our area, river, the um, river region, river region, um, didn't quite understand option two. So, but we explained to 
them without oxygen. The, the, yeah. The other thing that's going to happen that I don't know if we directly referred to, so I'm glad to bring this back up, is each principal has been directed, and, and we had a good discussion on this, that they, once, once this becomes a public document, this isn't even considered public until this process plays out today. Once it becomes public, as early as starting tomorrow and into next week, they plan on having parent meetings. Some of them have parent Facebook um, live streams. Some of them have uh, different methods of communication with their parents, but they're gonna utilize what's in place to go deeper and explain and answer questions on these models as well. So hopefully they can help your parents because up into, and also they'll now have the translation that is some that might be helpful to some of your parents and um, we'll try to further their understanding of those three different options. Because a lot of our grandparents are, yep. our parents to our students. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, so, so they're in a rural area where they're not. So specifically, I can speak to that in the San Juan River region because I've been working with the principals in that region and they are each developing an individual plan um, that will provide context. So whether a parent calls them, they'll have the school staff and ready to support that, which is they also have a plan in place for a virtual communication as well as call out. So um, I know in Montezuma Creek specifically, both um, Principal Jacobson and Principal Schaefer are working on a plan together um, to call families, contact families, and provide the information for them. And then yeah, so I'll speak to that because I think that's a really good point and I should, probably should have brought that up earlier. So recognizing that many of our students do not have access um, to digital learning, if they choose the home environment, how we have set up these campus courses allows for um, support that, that can be provided for students who don't have internet connection because we've really focused on those key big rocks that align to the essential standards. Um, and so that learning support will still be available for a student. And some of those processes will look individually by school, but some of the things that um, we have been able to discover over time is that you know having a student be able to use a Chromebook offline, so downloading materials. So one of the first routines teachers will teach their students is what can be downloaded and saved to a device so you don't have to have internet to access it. We're also working in the uh, elementary and some of our secondary coursework, the curriculum textbooks can be downloaded to the device, does not require any internet at, you know, access at all. Um, a lot of what we've looked at, we've added some media into those campus platforms, um, but a student doesn't have to access that media to be able to do a lot of that learning. So um, by providing the textbook digitally without a virtual connection, that does help with some of those situations. We also will be working with families one-on-one -on -one in designing an individual learning plan for those students um, that are in that situation. So the administrator, um, the t classroom teacher, as well as other support staff in the school will work individually to develop an individualized learning plan to support the needs of the student that may be in that situation. I do think, though, that parents will have to take that information into consideration when they make their choice. I mean, the level of, we have, we have taken some additional steps to improve our effectiveness even with a student without connectivity but I don't think I'd ever ever make the statement that a lack of connectivity is still going to be a barrier it's still gonna be a little challenge it is and so I think parents have to weigh everything all of those variables that are unique to their situation in their decision and so it is it is a challenge and I know Kim uh, Mr. Schaefer uh, approached Hesse in elimination yeah, we're, department we, up yeah. There. Yeah. we are we do we are participating in some meetings even with the office of Indian Affairs the state office of education we're talking all about how to improve our 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 ability our connectivity issues across the Navajo Nation I don't know what's going to come from it I hope something comes from it but I've had talks in the past and they've, they've kind of sometimes roadblocked when the when we just hit a, 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 a road bar block so large we couldn't get up and there are discussions happening before us to as as parents choose you know choose their option that even with option one the teacher is a teacher in the classroom and during the school day the parents are also in in my mind we're always our kids teachers as well if we choose parent teaches or chooses to, they take on additional role of teaching their student and being the mentor and the coach. And three as well, but the whole idea of we are our students' teachers and gratefully, 
we have additional teachers that they get to go to school and have that opportunity. But we have a, I guess, um, if, if kids only have the teacher at school, then they don't have that opportunity that maybe another child has. And so if we can instill in parents that anything, not anything, but additional things that they do with their children at home that are, um, that is academic in nature, but maybe, maybe a, a game, maybe all kinds of things where parents have a lot of opportunity to enhance their child's academic um, education at home on, our, on a regular basis. But, but maybe this is a good time to help parents understand the impact that they can, they have the opportunity to impact their child's education on any of these, any of these choices. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I could, so there's one other thing that I want to include in the packet. Um, if, if you go back, I, I was, I did think that, you know, parents, I think sometimes need as much information as they can get as well. The most current information that is coming, and I've seen this in a couple of different places that I could find. There's an article in the Deseret News. Um, can you open that up? That the does. KSL the, article, or do you want your Yeah, the KSL, maybe it was oh. KSL. Yeah, that's what okay. I do want to include this, that the, the um, Academy of Pediatrics, Pediatrics. Pediatrics. <laughs> yes. But they are claiming that when you weigh all the risks and you look at it as a whole, that still they, they do claim that it, kids should be in school. So um, I think there's still variables that are individualized, and that's why parents have to make the final decision. But as a whole, that's the information that's coming out right now is that there are a lot of social and emotional risks to these students as well, educational risks as well, and there's a lot to consider for parents. So I did want to include this article in the packet as well um, and go from there. So unless the board did not feel comfortable with that being a part of it, it would be included. Um, the one last thing to maybe just quickly look at is the protocols. I could pull those up just quickly. And these aren't completely finished, but they will give you an idea of, I don't know, maybe it's going to make you a way to go. Maybe at the top. Okay, so yeah, if you'll, and probably the one I'd go down to, these are the protocols we're building. There's a number of them that will be, you know, we'll make sure the administrators have copies of these, the teachers are aware of these, and like I said, they're not quite ready to roll yet, but if you scroll down a little, the one that, go keep going, keep going. I want to go to the next protocol for sure. Okay, so right there, you know. When a staff or student becomes ill, this would walk through step by step. And there's also a flow chart that would accompany this of what will happen. But I just want you to be aware that we're getting to that level of making sure that our staff and our students are prepared to know what would happen in the case of this or the case of that. It's, it's not going to be, well, what do we do now? Um, anyway, and these recommendations are all coming from the health department. They're providing this support to us. So we're just working closely with them. So we have, we have scheduled 90 minutes. We have 20 left. Let's open it up for a few questions. So that's great. Six. Yep. So, okay, we uh, scheduled 90 minutes for this presentation. We have 20 minutes left. So I will open it up for some questions. Three minutes per question and answer per individual. So if you have some for the superintendent or the assistant superintendents, you're free to ask those. You want to start with the gentleman there? Yes. Would you like to offer your questions at this time? Yeah. Okay. So do you want to come up a little bit so we can hear you? I will set the timer. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. 
Those are for 6 p.m., man. That's for the public session at 6. Yep. So if you have another question, yes, you can ask Nelson. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not there. Uh, are there people there in person? Yes, we probably got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven. Mostly okay. teachers, yes. Okay, if you'll state where you're from. <clears throat> okay, I'm uh, Malcolm Lehi, uh, tribal rep for White Mesa, sitting on the Youth Mountain Youth Tribal Council. Um, just had some concerns and didn't know you guys were having this meeting because you haven't let the tribe know that you know, we need to be a part of this kind of the government to government thing that I'm talking about here. And we haven't been at a lot of your meetings. Um, I know we met with you uh, last year. Yep. Uh, and um, that there were some issues that we brought to your attention that we haven't seen yet and that you haven't came back to us. So tribal council asked me to come and just kind of speak on that behalf of, um, you know, working with uh, the U Mountain U Tribe. I see you work with the Navajo Nation, but, you know, there were some issues that we represent, presented to you at that time to see if we can get a community member or tribal member to sit on the board because our community is not being represented within the board. The other thing that I see that, um, just kind of disappoints me here is looking at my flag looking sideways you know kind of makes me feel that I'm being disrespected not only as a person but as a member of this tribe and um, other things that come along with it I know you're trying to work with Kelda Rogers and I would um, assume she would have been here too to listen in and I don't know I seen you're on um, live air too and that's how I was kind of listening to the beginning of um, your um, meeting here, but um, due to the fact that um, I, know I was a little late, but um, just concerns in regarding our students, and just by listening on what your protocol is and all these issues that you're gonna do, and it's good to hear that, but you know, the thing that my concern is, um, I know you guys don't have the, um, the medicine for it. So, you know, I see you have your protocol and if something was to happen and one of the kids get affected um, and takes it back home, you know, those are the things that I'm looking for. Um, more intense protocols that need to be in place than just kind of saying, okay, these are the guidelines we're going to go by. I don't know where you got that, but it sounds like you're not finished with it and you're still working on it. that's good but at this time and frame this coronavirus is very important and more important than having our education and that's why I'm here because my concern is our students of White Mesa I don't want them to come to school and get affected by this coronavirus because I know it's here in Blandon I've heard the stories. I sit on the Blue Mountain Hospital board. I know how many people are affected here. And, and it's very important to us. Okay. Thank so you. I, I will let him respond. For two yeah. Minutes. Thank you. So first of all, Mr. Lehi, um, I, I I feel like I'm following the direction of you, Chai. Yeah. I meet with Kelda. Like, they asked me to meet with her regularly. Okay. So we meet quarterly. And we've been doing that now for two years. If, if you would like to, any direction that the youth uh, council would like to give me, I would like to follow. So I'll visit with you personally okay. and just make sure that we are on, on the same page. But I felt like I was following that council's recommendation because yeah. we've had some very good collaboration yeah. with, with Kelda and with her educational, which is what I felt like I was told to yeah. work closely with the educational department. Okay, but well, I'll, I'll work with you personally. And we'll, I appreciate that. that. That was the only question I had. Okay. Okay. Um, just listening to what your protocols you got in place is good. I mean, I hear that there's good stuff there that can happen for our students, but mainly my concern is the coronavirus. I mean, it's really important that we really um, take care of that. Um, I mean, first priority to me for our students. Um, and I hope that Kelda would have been here. Maybe she's listening uh, on the live broadcast, but um, 
I appreciate it. That's all the only concern I have. Before you leave, if you could leave me your contact information. I'll get okay. it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Let me reset my timer. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Go. Go. First of all, <laughs> that's, I appreciate this, and you guys have done a fabulous job. I am so impressed. Um, I have one concern that is probably on there somewhere, but I haven't seen it, so. I don't favor students being able to change options whenever convenient for parents. Mm -hmm. And is there a time frame such as mid-year or something when they can change if they see that the students at Landing Elementary aren't getting sick and so, okay, I'll let my kids come. Can they do that maybe mid-year? I don't want to see them coming in like we're using us as a babysitter for this week or next week or whatever. Sure. We've looked at that. That's a great comment that we've discussed. You know. We felt like ideally we'd like to see as many students in the classroom as possible, as parents felt comfortable. We didn't want to coerce or try to persuade any parent that did feel comfortable. But ideally, educationally, we felt like the classroom was the best place. So it's hard. We, we do think we might, anyway. And we knew there was going to possibly be some quarantine kids back and forth. And we knew that we wouldn't say, oh, if you're quarantined for 14 days, you're quarantined till the end of the quarter. So we knew there'd be some going back and forth. So at this point, yes, there is the flexibility of some back and forth. I think we may look at if it's just back and forth constantly, we might address that on a personal level, but there is some of that in there and we really addressed it. But ideally, we was hoping to get more parents to feel comfortable and continue. We hope the classroom would grow, which would tell us the COVID situation is 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 reducing, is, is, is uh, well, and it's not getting better children in my day but, like they may have thought. Yeah, oh, so, but it, now Do option three, it, it would not be. Option three is not, but They're option. They're in there for, for the whole year? Option three, if they sign up for those courses, at least for a grading period, they've got to take a course. Yeah. Okay. So it'd be a grading period. And we have had conversation with administrators recently as today um, in your buildings that um, really encourage conversation with parents about what's best for the educational, you know, for their edu the educational side and for their student safety side and trying to make a good mesh of that. And um, we recognize that for students, it's not, it's not going to be in their best interest educationally to come back and forth every other day or just whenever they want. But we're, we can encourage those things and we've talked about encouraging through the quarter, through the end of a course at least, so that we have some um, continuity However, we do recognize that, you know, with it being a parent's right state, we're going to have to honor some of that flexibility. So I know it's heavy and it's hard, but um, but we're gonna we're gonna try to do as much have as much conversation with parents as we can and educating the you know um, educational influence that we can have when they're there. So so and I will just add that as part of the registration packet that they'll be completing, it will say on option two, we're asking them to select either my student will start in person and I will notify the school when they are ready to, you know, sorry, there will be, I'm, my student starting in person, then there'll be an option under option two to say my student will start at home and I will notify the school when my student's ready to return to school in person. So that oh, so data will be part of it. Yeah, so it's not, it won't be that you've got yeah, 10 okay. students show up at a school that have never been there that year. So that's yeah. going to be part of the, the process because we realize the pressure that puts on a teacher. Really, with option two, our plan, you know, with that that Canvas module, is to say, you know, if a student is out and then they come back, you know, they're still on that same learning. You're going through that same thing, so they're not, you know, they may be behind because they haven't done as much of the work as they need to, but they're in the same spot. So that is another choice that we made to try to help support teachers so right. that it it's not such a dr drastic spot that they're coming back on. Um, so I mean, there, and then again with option two, it really is that thinking of. You know, differentiated system of support is part of our San Juan Quest model. So, the thinking is is that the administrator, any other support staff that supports you know student advocacy and the classroom teacher will work together with that family. And in option two, you're assigned to a classroom teacher. So we know if you have 25 students in your class and you have a couple of those in that situation, you're working with the administrative team, um, the student advocacy team to really develop a plan that works for that student that is. Can, can be supportive through the classroom teacher right. without it all being on you. Yeah, that, I get that. Okay. Thank you, and thank you again. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else?
Let us follow up with you on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it. Anything else? Okay. Steve. I have another question. Sure. Um, you said that option three was no cost to the parent. What's the cost to the taxpayer? Um, the cost to the taxpayer to purchase the curriculum for for the ingenuity notes schools PLP four hundred ninety five dollars. Per license so we know we're paying that ingenuity I believe you pay by the course so any student that chooses option three when you when you fill their schedule it could be anywhere from five hundred dollars to pushing even two thousand dollars and a, and a WPU is like thirty five hundred dollars so we're receiving thirty five thirty six hundred dollars per child through the WPU so if we have a significant number that choose that option or paying that amount per student then we still have all the fixed costs of the exactly. just regular right. instruction that could be significant. Yeah. So. Exactly. We, we, we know that and we know that, uh, yes, uh, we do keep some funding in the district, but if we had a substantial number of students that were in option three and they stayed there long term, you would see a situation where we would be overstaffed in areas of the district teacher-wise <coughs> because we would not need that many teachers. So yes, there's potential here to see how this all balances out down the road a ways and what happens there. Looks like option three to me resembles homeschooling a lot. Uh, is, is there a requirement? Is, the, is that homeschooling? No, or? no, it's not homeschooling. And it, 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 what it resembles, it, it, it is. There's a track of, of a public school that is at home. There's just not a brick and mortar school for it. But you've got your Utah Online, you've got your K-12 Academy, um, and, and now about all of your larger districts now have a virtual school within their district. And so it's literally a public school, follows all the same guidelines, but it's not a, there's no brick and mortar school. The, wh wherever those students are enrolled through whichever district gets the WPU, the 35 or $3,600 that's between those, but they still have to provide the services for that student. We have not done, we've only individually tried to fill a few schedules. We've never really dabbled in it very far, but this situation is requiring us to go a little further than we've ever gone. And we are establishing, option three is literally establishing a little avenue within our district that now will be a virtual school. In fact, we even, we even kind of contemplated maybe we should call it the 13th school of our district. We don't know long term if this what it's going to look like. If there's a substantial amount of parents that want to continue in that. Now, let's say we don't provide the option to them. One thing we said, well, maybe we should let them go to other places. If they go other places, we lose all $3,600 for them. If they, go to, if they jump into Utah online, that's Washington County. If they jump into a Harmony, it's called Harmony Educational Services, that's a company out of Springville that does online schooling. Um, uh, well, Academy, K-12 Academy, that's another virtual. If they jump into any of those, we completely lose all funding. So we felt it was in our best interest to try to provide a similar experience with hopes, or at least learning what happens, whether they get in there and come back, we've still got attachment to them, or if they, if they go that route with that option and they like it long term, we will have to adjust. But if they, even if we don't provide the option and they get into that route, because they're getting recruited, I don't know if you've noticed, but the advertisements for the online schools are really, yeah, I'm seeing them all over the place right now. And I heard on the radio yesterday morning driving to work that Texas online schools have seen something like a 63% increase. So there's a big market right now, this COVID pandemic's driving that. 
we felt the best option for this district was to provide the option, try to be supportive, and hope that either enough of them that stay there that we could actually maintain this option long term, or they come back to us in either option two or option one, and we'll, we won't necessarily continue that option long term. It'll depend on what we see. So the biggest difference though between homeschooling and online option is the teacher. So the teacher in a homeschool situation is the parent or guardian. The teacher in, a, in one of these platform P schools, field peer ingenuity, is we have either a teacher of record here at our school that works with the students for our secondary core areas or for schools PLP, the teacher is hired and part of what we pay for is that teacher through their program that is hired. So in homeschooling they don't have that additional teacher piece. In the online piece they do have a teacher that is actually working with them. And even to drill a little further, in homeschool the parent accepts all of the responsibilities. So they have to literally provide documentation to the district that they are accepting those responsibilities. State, state law requires that. So if there's somebody officially declaring homeschool, you will see a letter in board meeting, you've seen them before in the past, that will state that they are declaring homeschool. Now they're no longer required by the public educational settings. They could still utilize our resources, but they're not required to do testing and those type of things. Charter school or online K-12 schools, they still have to follow all those same guidelines. They're still funded by the, the WPU. And still the parent does play a bigger role in those, but they're still in a public school setting. Private homeschoolers, if there are not. I wonder if we'll, we'll get some homeschoolers back with that option three. I hope they do and I hope they like yeah. it. And then, and honestly, eventually we talk about our vision for that um, option three really is, right now we're, we're not in a position to ask our teachers to, co to create and be ready with content for an online virtual piece and a blended learning piece. So we're, we're just not in that position. But someday, like Washington County School District, some other school districts have put together um, the, that content within their district, and then it happens within their district and it's not outsourced. Um, so, you know, long-term vision is we could look at that. We could look at, at trying to utilize something right within our district, but we just, we don't have the capacity to build all of those courses and, and anyway, provide all of that with, with our teachers on top of what they're already doing. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, is there a plan to, like a year from now, to, to have a way to gauge the effectiveness of the different options, the three different options, like assessment or? At this point, we have not formalized or had deep discussions about that topic, no. And the last question is, who's the document editor for, for this? I think yes, that's okay, it. That's good. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. And and Julie and Christy, thank yeah, you. Thank you. I just speaking for myself, I appreciate I told the superintendent I like that the documents were twenty pages of single space and I mean it was just it was very informative and concise and I know there's a ton of work that went into this from all aspects and Julie and Christy with your work too and under you and Eva so thank you and the record time yeah yeah <laughs> there was a lot of deadline there time was a bit actually we're really excited <laughs> 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 we're, we're moving in a direction wow. that in a lot of ways we need to be anyway and even though it's forcing us it's making us be better it was improvement so and the principals feel the same way all of our conversations with principals are so positive yeah, I felt I felt there was so much answered, and yet I don't have a volume sitting here. And yeah. just it's very good job. Easy to read. read. Thank you. Yeah. I'm very really the white for doing the translation. Yes, and the translation. There's you guys packed a lot in there, so I awesome. really appreciate it. Um, okay, Kyle, five minutes. The virtual school. Okay. Um, just got a short presentation here. Probably won't take five minutes to get through it, but. Just to give the board an update, I guess there was some discussion um, in regards to online payment systems. So we currently have QuickBooks, which operates as our online payment system. Um, it's a 2.99% uh, 
cost charge every time that there's a credit card run, so that is an option that parents have. Um, in a discussion with administrators previously, uh, in looking at some of those types of options and evaluating some of the companies, because as you know, there are third-party companies that do offer um, school fees payments. And so in working not only with those companies and evaluating what they offer as far as a product and price, we've also looked at um, some of the options as far as what we have internally. So to go to the first slide, there's benefits, trade-offs for the online payment. Uh, convenience payments can be made from anywhere. Obviously, that makes it simpler for parents. They can make those payments from any different type of location. Um, it's definitely given us a different uh, viewpoint and option in regards to COVID-19 with minimizing the interaction face-to-face. And that we can also pass on at least a portion or a larger majority of those cost of fees or the percentage transactions, percentage per transaction that's charged currently um, back to the parents and families that choose to use that as a benefit or a convenience method to pay their fees. Um, some of the trade offs for that are, is the additional cost, obviously, to families. So, depending upon how much their fees are, that percentage will increase um, incrementally based on the amount that they'd be paying. Um, tech support is one of the other portions that's um, something that we've evaluated and looked at extraneously to make sure that if we get a system and when we get some type of an additional system on board that it's something we can sustain or manage or that there's a support team there to manage that. One of the systems that we've looked at internally is possibly using our Aspire system which already contains all of our student information and so in adding to or supplementing by putting together those fee schedules the parents would be able to get online, register their students, and with those registrations, um, be able to identify the individual expenditures that would be attached to each student depending upon their participation level or the different activities that they'd be involved in. Um, online security is obviously one of the biggest driving factors, and that's something that we work very closely with the state on to make sure not only that the system is PCI compliant, um, but that we also have the fortitude to be able to support any of those systems and ensure that we minimize any opportunities for fraud or hacking to exist, which is never 100%. Um, the word fee in this presentation again refers to the charges for those parents and families um, for what their students participate in between different activities as far as, um, you know, band, choir, different athletic um, dues that are, that are due for their participation on those different sport teams. And then again, the processing fee from what we've researched has been anywhere from 2.9 to 4% of the total transaction amount. Now currently when they pay on QuickBooks, that amount is deducted, like I stated earlier, from the total. So let's say for example, if they came in and paid a $10 fee, the 2.9% would be deducted before that money would be deposited into the school account. Um, as of July 8th and looking at our current financial situation, um, financial secretaries, which predominantly include, or predominantly affect San Juan High and Monticello High School and Albert Lyman Middle School, um, due to the fact that Monument Valley and Whitehorse are predominantly fee waived are the, are the three highest locations where we process credit cards or take fees currently. Um, so again, in looking at what we're bringing in, the district's basically subsidizing approximately 2.5% um, of those costs by paying that out or reducing that from the amount of fees that are paid. So through the current option that we have of QuickBooks, there can be a digital invoice created and we actually ran a test with this with Mr. English. Um, where they were able to generate an invoice internally at the school, send that to him through email. He was able to pay his daughter's fees through that email link and then um, that money was able to be deposited and can be added to that invoice, that percentage or transaction fee, so that basically the parent would be carrying the brunt of that uh, additional cost as opposed to passing that along to the school district. So we do have that option right now currently. Um, and moving ahead and looking at some other options, um, we can see here Ed Leo Pay Schools, My School Fees are some of the different companies we've looked at. Um, my second year at the school district, we evaluated some of these companies. The prices have reduced dramatically from um, when it was preliminarily looked at. Um, the biggest challenge was looking at anywhere from a $2,000 to a $5,000 um, a year prescription or subscription, not prescription, subscription to those different entities. And for the amount of fees that we bring in, again, it would be focused on those three schools. So now it's one of the challenges that we looked at. So again, that's just kind of a breakdown of the different percentages, processing fee percentages that are being charged. Um, again, going back to the Aspire SIS system, right now currently we were in talks with the state to find out whether or not 
Um, we can we can use some different systems. If PayPal, for example, would be an option, that's something that we could utilize as a third-party payment processor um, with our Aspire system, which again would have all of our student data. One of the biggest challenges we have with going outside the district is providing and keeping current all of that data information with that outside entity to the point that they would need an updated fee schedule as well as continual updates on student records, ID, um, SIS information to make that congruent and work smoothly as far as a, a processing system. So we have a system in place currently. It works, it operates. We're trying to find more of a convenient method to be able to offer to parents. But again, that comes, most of these with an additional cost anywhere from two to 5% on top of what the district would pay to have a subscription with those different outside processing systems. Questions? Is this informational or what, what do you need from us on this? Uh, so that I, there was a request, I believe, brought up by Ms. Mon with Mr. Nelson. Um, to. There's been several requests from parents, especially I mean, the exchange of money and going to the school with COVID and on and on and on, that, that request has come up. And especially, and not only that, but there's so many people that pay online now, and in order to pay the school, you should have to mail your check-in, but... Is Venmo? Venmo's not a state approved. So as of two years ago, Venmo and PayPal were not state approved processes for receiving funds. We have challenges with that um, from fundraising across the district. So I guess to go back and answer your question, President Black, this is just informational, let the board know what we currently have, what we're evaluating, and what we're looking at for the future for potential options for processing for parents. Because as of right now, for example, if a parent registered their student, they could call into one of the financial secretaries and pay that way online. They would, they would carry the cost of that um, processing fee if we're able to do it through the invoice method as opposed to the district eating it if they called in and, and processed it that, through that method. Do many parents know about that? Well, we've just started in Monticello. So as up till last year, San Juan High School has not taken credit cards. We got them set up this last year when Ms. Julie Black retired. So Catherine Bradford's now set up and has been able to take credit cards for the last year. So I think that there's just an option to do that because there's, there's going to be parents that don't, I mean, I'm thinking we're not a, in the north, is you know, is impacted with COVID. But what about like Lucille's area and Nelson, your area, to, for parents to go in and? We don't I mean, they oh, can't go in the school because we're not allowing. I mean, we're a lot of people volunteer, so. And they, they have an option to do that. They can do that over the phone right now. So there is an option to collect those. And again, we're we're looking into the possibility of using that online invoice through QuickBooks to be able to send those out so the parents could pay that. We would actually be able to add that processing percentage onto that invoice so that that brunt would be covered by the parent as a convenience fee. But again, looking at the Aspire system, if we could manage that or house that internally, it would hopefully save a lot of issues with database and student information and would make it a little bit smoother. The, the con to that is that we would rely predominantly on basically two of our employees to help structure, put that together, and monitor the ongoing management and operation of that system. So there's pros and cons to going outside of the district or trying to work with what we have internally right now. Now, Monument Valley and Whitehorse are predominantly fee waived, so we're sure. talking anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of parents that might possibly pay fees for their students to participate. So, what are you thinking with? Um, well, I think given the the environment currently and where we're going, it's kind of a given that people can pay their fees from home. You don't have to make a trip to the school. You don't have to dig out the checkbook and dust it off and bring it in. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, that, that's my opinion. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I personally that I am opposed to is is passing on those fees to, to the parents because you're ignoring all the benefits that using a credit card medium offers to the school district. So but, uh, I don't know if that's a discussion for another day or... No, and that's a good point. And, and the discussions that we've at least had on the administrative level is trying to pass that on basically as a convenience method because predominantly in the past, at least for San Juan High School, like I said, up until last year or previous years, Monticello was taking credit cards for a lot of years. Up to last year, San Juan High School just started taking credit cards just because of, of practice and maybe not necessarily... So what happens is it ends up coming, it ends up being a 
couple thousand dollars. You know, Monticello High School, San Juan Heights, over the year, over the course of the year, that they're paying those convenient fees, and that generally just has to come out of their school budgets. Um, so that that was the purpose in trying to build something to fit convenience fee. And a lot of places you pay that convenience fee when you use a credit card. A lot of eating mm -hmm. um, establishments and things like that. A few. Yeah. That's definitely or, been part of oh, yeah. Well, or or whoever's taking credit cards at whatever you know business or entity, they built the they built that in, and so you're paying it anyway. But in our case with school fees, with school fees, you it would have to be a convenience fee. another option to pay, or if you want to pay the the percentage. Okay, I was having a hard time following the whole thing. So if I can backtrack and just clarify, um, because so I think we've got it straight. <laughs> right, straight now that that it's been a traditional payment system, as in traditional, like when my kids were in school. Except for Monticello started on their own. I mean, Monticello has utilized the option of QuickBook or uh, credit um, card and processing. Then San Juan High School has now started this, but um, ARL hasn't. Uh, the, the basis for where we're starting and where we're possibly going is, I guess, where I was um, a little bit confused through the discussion. So in trying to figure it out, I, I probably lost some understanding when I was trying to follow the discussion. My question would be now, so if that's accurate and we're not doing anything at ARL and then the Southern Schools, um, River Region <laughs> Schools are, are and we have a small percentage of people paying, but they haven't implemented any credit card payments for them yet. Is that accurate? In visiting with both of those schools, they don't have a large majority of parents that come in and pay. And Chris, maybe you can give a different perspective, but they don't have a lot of them that come well, in correct. and pay with That's, But what I'm saying is the people who pay, do they have the option of paying with credit cards? Yes. You just mentioned. Okay. Yes, they do. Okay. And then, so have you checked? Well, what school districts, I know these larger school districts, they have some options that we don't have, and they've been paying online for a, for a very long time. So, you know, they've got all kinds of resources that, that we don't have. But have you checked with other smaller school districts to see what they do? Which districts have you checked with, and what are they using? So, Provo, I could pull up the list. There's 10 different school districts that were a part of that email. Um, seven of those came back and said they use TES, which is the My School Fees, which is highlighted on the presentation here. Um, and then there are, I think, Skyward, so a couple of their other student information systems have online payment options that you, they use, like our Aspire system. That's what they're using is their internal student tracking system to use those for us as payments. Okay, so when you talk about Aspire system, are we looking at something now that is sophisticated enough that when parents go in, they register their kids, they pick their, you know, activities, and the amount is listed online and then they can go in and that's totaled up for them and then they can put in a credit card number and pay it that that is currently happening they're not no, happening no, no, that's and, so that's that's, that's that's what, what we're currently investigating here. and trying to get clarification okay. on the state because again it would have to be through a paypal option or a third party financial system okay. and so assuring that that made state standards for collecting dollars for a state institution pci compliance or okay. We're waiting to get clarification on this. So state. again, for small school districts, um, who have you been in contact with, and what are they using? Pi U Provo. I don't have a list. I could provide a list to you, Mary. But I, I, I've reached out to all of the business administrators across the state to ask them what different systems they're using. So I've gotten those responses. I don't have those individually. Do you know how many of them are passing on the processing fee to parents or not passing on the processing fee? The majority of the school districts that I talk to are covering the cost of those processing fees. They're not passing it on to the parents. So the way, just to clarify, the way we have a setup is they can call in and they'll process their card, but they can't use a card when they register. They'll have a total, but then they'll have to call in. Correct. So are you suggesting Aspire would allow them to pay at the time of registration? So Aspire would give us the possibility of being able to do that. We haven't fully, we haven't fully investigated that. That would be a David and a Jonathan thing that we need to pull them in, and again write an internal process or procedure to make that work. So at this point, it's all guesstimate, again, based upon 
finding acceptance or knowing that the state would approve us to use an outside third party vendor like PayPal or some other type of financial institution. But right now the capacity with San Juan and Monticello is to call in and they can't. Correct. Okay. And we can, so we can generate through QuickBooks, we also have the ability to generate an invoice, send that directly to an email of a parent, which they could pay online, go in and pay, that's run through QuickBooks. And that's something that Kathleen Ketron is currently doing at Monticello High School and has the ability to do. So she can generate an internal invoice, they can go into register student inspired, she can go get that information, generate an invoice, email that invoice to the parent, they could then pay online and then have that money transferred to the school. Okay, so maybe what we need to do is Keep, keep as it is at this point because I mean we're to July, but we're gonna obviously. Do we want to look into this further about making it so the online registration? I mean I can see it next well, year. I mean is that what something we want to do? Pursue, Steve? What do you think? Or keep it the way it is. They just could call it. Well, I think it's worthwhile to pursue it. Okay, Lucille, Nelson. Yeah, um, I, I still, I'm still not clear about if, if all schools have this method of, of payment, do schools have a card of their own? No, this is for parents so that they can call in and pay their students' fees and do it virtually. And you're in favor of pursuing it? Yes, I, I would like to see almost immediately if Kathleen is doing something in Monticello that allows people to get an email invoice, access that when it's convenient for them, pay that when it's convenient for them. I've called our schools lots of times when nobody's available, you have to leave a message. To, we all know how, you know, that's why we use text, that's why we use email, because you can do that when it's convenient for you. The person on the other end can do it when it's convenient for them. For people to hook up on a telephone at the same time can be really, really, really difficult during school hours. So I would like to see that implemented district-wide right away to have that convenience for parents. It's, it's just, just almost impossible. Somebody gets a break from work um, and tries to call the school. They're not available. It's Steve. I was going to mention I. I do that in my business, send out over uh, an invoice that they just pay online, mm -hmm. especially in the current environment. You know, send yeah. online, pay online, uh, minimize the, the back and forth at all. So, yeah. and there's lots of there's lots of services. You know, I use Square. Uh, there's lots of them that will do the trick. So. Okay, I think that's what we want to do. Yeah, before but school starts this year, parents should be made available because that's it's it's such a hassle to hook up and. Well, I know that Kathleen's hey. taking advantage of having that time right now to be able to generate some of those invoices for kids that have already registered. Okay. We'd like to see it so they can pay for it when they register. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Bonnie, are you ready? Yes. Thank you. I should have bumped you up a little earlier. She just sits. <laughs> you did so nice over there. Well, she just sits so yeah, nicely in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Okay. I'm here to uh, talk to you about the early literacy plan uh, that the state asked us to uh, participate, or we have the opportunity to participate in. This, because of COVID, we did not have, we didn't finish out the process that uh, we generally do. We have a, a beginning of the year assessment, middle of the year, and end of the year assessment. Uh, we had some goals last year that I presented here last year. And uh, for kindergarten, first, second, and third grade in literacy, and uh, because we didn't have the final, the state decided to have us just move those goals over to this year. So uh, I'm basically presenting the same, the same uh, presentation that we did last year. The, the same. Uh, sorry, sorry. What's the jazz going on here? <laughs> I just wanted to like <laughs> really. <laughs> just presentation, Bob. <laughs> Do you dance while you're out? <laughs> 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 okay, um, Barney Wrangler, everybody. <laughs> I have to control her. 
<laughs> I know, I gotta change my rainbow. <laughs> um, so anyway, we are just going to ask for uh, your approval on a plan that, that, we, that you approved last year. We're going to be working on the exact same goals uh, uh, for growth, 60% uh, growth goal, that's a state, that's a state goal that they set for us. Uh, and then we do have a, a second grade goal and a third grade goal for this coming year. Uh, and uh, you loaded this document, did you? Yeah. You, you have a copy of it. Uh, I, I really don't, the, the state has a process where we can kind of get, they can kind of take a look at our plan before we bring it to the board. We have been, our, our plan has been pre-approved by the state. Now I just need your approval and then we put it we put it in through Utah Grants. The budget that goes along with this grant pays, most of the budget pays for salary and benefits of interventionists. Uh, there are opportunities for a small amount of supplies, but generally, and I'm sure this year, most of it will go right into uh, K3 intervention support salary benefits. And so that's, I, I guess you yeah. decide on this during another part of the meeting. Is that yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So, yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Bonnie. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We are, we can do information items. Down to information items. Um, just be aware, uh, I was told you last meeting I'd be in Logan on the 30th and 31st. That's been changed to virtual. So I'll still be having those meetings, but virtual. And there are, the schedule is a little different. Um, I talked about the administrative leadership training days on the 6th and 7th. Next board meeting is August 12th. So put that on your calendar, make sure it's there. Please be aware that the NAFIS conference for fall has been canceled. Decisions been made, and then you have the board meeting dates, which you've had for a while. So, those are the information items. Did you? There you got some good music. You guys rotate and if I want to jump in I will. You guys rotate these questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If I need to, uh, you guys cover them better than I do anyways.
just put you between one on either side of us at this point. Yeah, I'm sitting that work. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Are we still at a Aaron, are you still 108 people following or is it? No, we're getting it's coming back up though. All right. It dropped down. It dropped when we went up right. Some space. comments that have come in via email and so we're going to have Eva read those but actually we're going to start with our first in-person comment and we'll allow you the three minutes to make your comment and then we will go to those Eva where you'll read them in and then we'll have three minutes to respond okay are you ready do you have your comment sheet? do you want to just hand that to Eva your hmm? com did you feel like your comment oh, let me use it. okay perfect well uh, <coughs> good evening Everybody, I hope that all is well for you and your families. Uh, first thing, I want to say thank you for the new gym at Montezuma Creek Elementary. I'm pretty sure a lot of people appreciate it. Uh, I've got three uh, questions I have. Uh, um, the, the first one is uh, somewhat important to a lot of people out there on the reservation. Um, when the school went into this uh, virtual learning the last uh, quarter, uh, last school year or this this past spring um, a lot of kids a lot of parents uh, everybody uh, when they went to this virtual learning uh, there was a lot of issues with uh, uh, connecting with the internet up where where I'm at around Cajon Mesa you know it's it's pretty you know it, it's hard um, kind of wish that um, or, you know, what, what I hope to see is uh, our um, board member, uh, Ms. Cody, and Ms. Yellow, uh, Mr. Yellowman, and uh, the superintendent. Is there a way that you guys can maybe get together with the Chatter House and the Navajo Nation? Uh, you know, it means that they got all this uh, um, um, support from the government. Is there a way that maybe they can set up a tower or something, you know, in the Cajon Mesa area where, you know, if this thing keeps going on, our kids is going to have a better, uh, better connection so they can continue to, you know, keep up with everything that's required. I can tell you we're having meetings and discussing that we're meeting with the Office of Indian Affairs, the um, Utah Department of Education and is involved and so we have direct uh, communication there with the Navajo tribe there mm -hmm. are meetings I don't know exactly what we'll be able to pull together but I, I, I know I know it's possible because they, left. they did that down there in, in Low Mountain which is it's in Arizona it's the most deserted you know country there is but they, they put up a tower for 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 the, the public there yeah. uh, if that's if they can do it you know that, that this shouldn't be it should be an easy fix and I'm I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for a lot of kids out around Anneth and probably down into uh, Monument Valley area. Mm -hmm. So, yep. you know, if you guys can consider that, uh, we would appreciate it. The other thing is um, with this uh, COVID uh, still around, uh, there's some kids that's going to be taking uh, college courses through, you know, with the high school. Um, is that going to be virtual learning or is that going to be in person down at the high school? Or what, what, what's you guys' plans as far as that? Do you want Julie to address that? Yeah. So those will, so concurrent enrollment courses that you're referring to, yeah. will, um, they will have a virtual component, and they, they, most of them have that right now. So there will also be an opportunity, and we're going to work with the individual schools, so if your students attend Whitehorse High School, Monument Valley High School, that they could go in for those times if you felt safe, you know, if you felt like that would be an option for them, so mm -hmm. that they could access those broadcast classrooms. So we're going to work through some of those details. So make sure to stay tuned on that, and but there are going to be options for them to be able to to still continue with those courses. Mm -hmm. it, the reason why I'm asking about this and I'm concerned about it is there's some 
you know, well, probably most students down in Whitehorse, if they had to be in person, they, they're probably looking at at least 50, 60 round trip, huh? Miles, you know, just go down to the school and come, you know, it's not like out here where, you know, you go to the next street, but, you know, the, out there is completely different, so, you know, I was just kind of wondering about that. Yeah, <coughs> so could I just, I'll make a comment as yeah. well, um, since I work with the schools in Montezuma Creek. So, I mean, we are definitely looking at other options and looking at any options, you know, besides just the hot spot. So if we can get a, a hot spot that's closer to the student, mm -hmm. um, that is definitely a possibility that we're looking at right now, working with our IT department. So it could be that they're offered an internet access, not maybe right at their house, but somewhere closer than the school that they could go to and, and work from. So those are, I mean, we're looking at every option out there to, to remedy this situation. Mm -hmm. Do you have a last know, question? My, my last one is, um, the, again, this past spring, uh, when everybody, all the kids were staying home, you know, they were getting their lunches and everything at home, which is, you know, fine and dandy. It's great that, you know, everybody is watching out for one another. The only thing is, after a while, it seems like it's the same old sandwich, the same old, you know, vegetable, everything was the same. I mean, it, it just went like that all the way through. I mean, the were the finances they put out for the kids, the, you know, for the people that put things together, then maybe we should be a little creative, you know. Uh, you know, that's just, uh, I'll speak to that just real fast. Yeah, oh. we, we, we definitely tried as hard as we could. We found out that we'd put in orders for food and mm -hmm. about 50% of our order was not filled. It was a really difficult time to be able to get food. All across the country, as you remember those grocery stores? Mm -hmm. The grocery store shelves were empty. So we had to deal with what we could get and we had to make sure we had enough for everyone so when we had an opportunity to buy enough for everyone, we bought quite a bit of it. So that meant you needed to use it up before it spoiled. So yes, but it, the real problem was we couldn't get everything we wanted. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very difficult time. I think that's kind of balanced out now, but that was very difficult. We were, we were afraid we weren't even going to be able to feed kids. Okay. We almost couldn't feed kids. Okay, hey, and then uh, as, as far as this, uh, the, uh, the hot spot, if you guys, you know, maybe get together with some parents and, and you know, come together, you know, the, the, and talk to the tribe or, you know, whoever to help us out there, that that would, that would be Everybody, the way to go. Um, <coughs> Kim did a presentation to Hesse mm -hmm. and Charlene So. They, they did a presentation to um, the Hesse people out there in uh, Winter Rock virtually. Mm -hmm. So they're aware of what's going the, on? The only reason is, the, re the reason why we're, we're saying this is Arizona, the people in Arizona, the, the communities, they're getting it. Why, what's wrong with, you know, what, what's wrong, how come we can't get it here in Utah? That, you know, it seems like we're always the last one getting things, so a lot of people are talking. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I thought I'd... Yeah. Thank you, and like I said, just kind of keep in touch with them and they'll let you know the progress. Of okay. Thank you. Thank you. Eva. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Mary Ann Woody was present at the three o'clock discussion. Her comment is internet is a problem for many parents on the reservation, do all parents have internet on the reservation? And that is her biggest concern um, for option three. Another parent, Philbert Cly, submitted an identical concern, and he's from the Monument Valley area. I think, did you fill that with how the download, do you wanna just reiterate that? Yeah, so um, one of the ways we are gonna mitigate that until we can resolve the internet issue is the campus coursework that we are designing is designed in particular to allow for um, downloading of some of the materials directly to a device that can be taken home without internet connection. So a student could access the textbook on the device without getting on online. The design of those courses, additionally what the teachers are doing is putting in components that can be completed with a piece of paper instead of having to submit it on Canvas. There's a variety of different resources that are being included as part of those Canvas modules. So we are fully aware that, that those challenges exist with a large percent of, of the students in the San Juan River region and teachers will be working with those students and families to um, have processes in place so they still can um, can you know 
submit their learning and participate in the learning process. Option three will not be a great option if, if that's what they're thinking. They don't have internet. Option three will be really difficult to try to uh, just select that option. So my comment would be, um, if, if that's the situation in the home, please choose option two. Thank you. Um, this parent, Tina Lansing, comments, as a parent and school community council member of Whitehorse High School, please know that the safety and well-being of our scholars and staff is the number one priority. We ask that when you make the choices today for school year 2021, that all necessary precautions are taken to best serve our scholars in providing the best quality education possible. Your consideration and support to our scholars' education is much appreciated. Tina Lansing. Nola Reese, who's an employee, a teacher, says, hi, it seems like the daily temperature taking that will be happening is on the shoulders of the parents. As a teacher, I would like to have that responsibility myself so that I can be sure my parents or my students are not sick when they come in the mornings. Could we shift that responsibility over to the schools or to the teachers, please? Nola Reese. I'll speak to that. All guidelines now coming down are saying that parents should retain that responsibility. We will be prepared in the school with non-touch thermometers. If there's somebody that appears sick, somebody that's showing symptoms, a child, we will be able to um, take a quick temperature at that point. But we are not going to be prepared for a complete lineup or all students to go through a process. And again, some of the reasons of why are it, there's just so many variables that factor into these mass um, thermometer readings when you line everybody up that they just don't feel the accuracy is there. And, and also you create problems by causing a bottleneck. So we will, at this point, it, it, our plan includes the parents taking a responsibility of that. Well, and to add to that, if all the parents, if the parents will do that, then that eliminates having a sick child that has already shown up at school. Yeah. Um, so, so to do it at school is a little late. The parents really do need to take that responsibility. And um, given that we're providing, some, you know, if I would say if a family needs a thermometer that doesn't have one, can we? We will work you know, with our social workers. We'll be prepared to make sure yep, that go out and work with families. We are, provide to pro we are prepared to provide thermometers to families. Okay. Next comment is from Nikki Safferett. She's a teacher. Um, she says, with the mandate on face masks in the fall, I highly suggest that teachers use a face shield instead of a mask so that students with hearing impairments can easily read lips and that other students see facial expressions through communication. It is very vital. Other schools are doing this, including University in Al Alabama. Vast improvement in communication when students are able to see the whole face in communication. I'm also curious on your viewpoints on ceramics. We recycle the clay after each use, so if we have hand sanitizer at the door and at the pug mill to keep it clean, it is very communal and other community use tools and supplies in the art room and school. I bet you have a lot to discuss, but I thought I'd mention these two things. <laughs> Nikki Zaffert. So we, uh, we appreciate your, the, the thoughts there and, and questions. Um, we are looking at all options for face shields, face coverings, and those will be available for all of our staff members and students. So that will be taken care of there. As far as high touch areas, that's the kind of thing that we're going to really have to have a conversation with our fine arts teachers. And we're, you know, the things that are communal and, and touched are, are most likely going to be, we're going to ask them to find other ways to, to, you know, to utilize the clay and utilize the art in different ways because we know that sharing, sharing high touch areas is not a wise decision. So we're talking about that even with um, sanitization of, micro, of like microscopes and um, shop equipment, all of those kinds of things. So those will be, we will have deeper discussions about that at the school level. But um, we're not going to encourage that, that we share um, manipulatives or any kinds of objects like that at school. This comment is from Rolanda Ness. She says, good afternoon, members of the San Juan School District staff. My name is Rolanda Ness. I live in Aljado, Utah. 
I'm a mother of four, one high school student, one middle, middle school student, and one elementary school student. I have some concerns about this coming school year with the COVID-19 at its highest on and off the Navajo reservation. I don't think I would like to have any kids go back to school at the school campus. I would rather have them stay at home and be homeschooled until I know that it's safe and to have my kids receive schoolwork online or be dropped off or picked up. I can't have my kids exposed to anyone that has COVID-19. They, my children, are close to their nollies and I do not want to have my kids get sick or, and to expose my kids to very deadly disease is a risk I'm not going to take. Their grandparents, mainly their grandmother who is very vulnerable to getting sick, is already fighting cancer. So with that said, please have options for us parents that are concerned about this school year and to be open-minded, to take into consideration that we as parents are just trying to do the best for our kids and family members, especially our elders. Sincerely, a concerned parent trying to keep my kids safe of COVID-19. Rolanda Ness. Right, so, yeah, so, so I'll, re I'll respond to that. I just really appreciate Rolanda reaching out and making that comment. And the comment from the other parent was that our top priority is, is keeping our students safe and our family members and community safe. So I think she really, you know, what she's saying is, is our goal as well. It's our number one priority. And so I really think with option two, that will provide um, a way for her students to still participate in their learning through the schools in Monument Valley um, and still be connected to their peers and a classroom teacher, um, but still meet the needs of her individual family. And that really is the learning models that we've designed are designed specifically for that individual family circumstance and to meet their needs. The next comment is from Sandra Jones. She states, Governor Herbert and Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez have both made comments to the effect that employees should work from home as much as their situation allows. Obviously, this is difficult in a school setting. What is San Juan School District doing to follow these guidelines at the district and school level? Are there provisions being made for older teachers and staff, those who are immuno immunocompromised, or others who are at a higher risk? Also, what about school and district staff who don't interact with students? Are they given the option to work from home? So we are um, expecting, you know, while student school is in session, we are expecting that employees be at work. And so even from teachers to paraprofessionals, if the role, if their role involves working with students um, and, the, and we have school in session, we're expecting them to be there. However, we do have protocols in place and Matt has developed um, some guidelines for our high risk, for anyone who may be at high risk, an employee. So we will work with those on a case-by-case -case basis, but, um, and, and we do, you know, we are following all of the, all of the state and, and district guidelines as far as leave and, adjust and, and being as um, lenient, but also expecting that they are at work. I would add to that that the Navajo Nation has definitely not come out with any formal stance on this upcoming school year. However, the governor has, and he has recommended, you know, of course he wants to see parent choice, but he has recommended schools are open and staffs are in schools. Okay. The next comment is from Tony Lewis. If your school board is holding a virtual meeting to discuss in-person school, then maybe it isn't the best time to send our children back to the classroom, wouldn't you think so? It's not like this meeting discussion could, couldn't have been held at one of the district gymnasiums with the social distancing and face coverings done appropriately. Why did you choose to have it in a virtual setting? Doesn't that speak volumes for this board to reopen school so quickly? Tony Lewis. Can Yeah, this meeting's been advertised that we stream it because we, do, we did not want the um, we certainly did control the amount of public that was in our building, but it was both a virtual and in-person meeting. And social distancing guidelines are in place with masks and social distancing. But it's a component of both in-person and virtual. Yes, and, and to mention, we they are gone now, but we did have, what, up to 10, 10 people who were sitting in our room with us. Um, 
We didn't limit anybody who came in. There didn't seem to be more people who wanted to come because we have over 100 streaming online. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So it's a good option, um, for Tone, that we offered both. So you And you can come on down to our meeting right now if you'd like to come in person. And we're and all here except for Nelson Yellowman. And it's a nice option for him because he has to travel so far. And or he may have just chosen to not be in close proximity, but everybody's been given the choice to do either. So that's and been last a nice month's board meeting was the same as well. Yes. And so we did it the same the last month as well. The next question is from Dana Frankovich. She asked, May I get a clarification for the blended option? Can the students stay home for the entire quarter and still have the classroom experience? as it was called, or do they have to be physically in school part of the time? So I can answer that. So the blended option, um, they could be home the entire time. So we're not requiring them to come into the school at all with option two. It is the most flexible. Um, so if they decided to do all at-home <coughs> learning, they still would be connected to their classroom teacher, to their peers in the classroom, and to their home school. The next question is from Arthur Adair. He asks, has it been discussed to go to a four-day week and also utilize an A and B day schedule for high schools to minimize contact and cut down on class sizes? This would also allow for more time for teachers on Friday. Thanks, Arthur Ader. Yes, it has, and there's variables that come into play, and at the end of that discussion and looking at those variables, it, w it was decided that this was the better option at this time. The next comment is from Dee Myers. She says, I would like to know why we can't take temperatures as the kids get on the bus. It seems like it would be best to stop a possible infection before they get on the bus, before they enter our building. And the best resource for extra manpower would, would be to take their temperature before they ever get on the bus. Thanks, Dee Myers. Yeah. I think we've answered that when we, we talked about the temperatures. Uh, the next question is from Tyler Bailey. He says, could you give more clarification on sports? For example, how are sports supposed to take place if all in-person gatherings are suspended? Thank you. As we say in our plan, we will follow the Utah High School Association guidelines and recommendations for sports. Um, and so w w there are some definitely some unanswered questions. But we will wait and get further guidelines from the Utah High School Association as they provide them. But we'll, we're just going to follow our guidelines. The next comment is from Chet and Tracy Johnson. They say, as parents and a teacher of two students who attend them on high school, we feel that the school environment, especially the start of school, is critical and vital to the functioning of the entire year for both academics mental and social well-being of not only our children, but kids throughout the district. Going back to an online format, if that is an option, is worrisome because it will not be like the spring quarter with all the students getting a pass. It will now count with grades and many kids, we feel, will not engage in the learning or fall behind. As a teacher, I want to see my students face to face, help them engage in the learning, and as a parent, I want that for my children as well. Sports are happening already, and we are all for it. Kids are in contact with other athletes, if not more so than even the classroom with one other during practices, games, etc. Let the school year progress as well. Sports are an important component to the school environment and this has already been allowed to begin. Let school begin as normal, in normal fashion as possible and take one day at a time. Asking the questions and communicating with those in the school and activities will be key to a positive and productive beginning Productive beginning for 2020 and 21 school year. Thanks for listening, Chet and Tracy Johnson. Yeah. I can respond okay, I, to it. I mean, all right, we agree with that. <laughs> yeah, we, we agree with, we agree that with all side. those issues. Yeah. I would say, um, <clears throat> yes, if students are in class, it, we do believe the most ideal place to start a school year is in person. But under the circumstances, parents have to have the ability and the right to choose with their comfort level. Even in the area of sports, parents choose whether their children are out participating in sports. So 
those that do not feel comfortable do not have their students or their, their children out participating. So it really boils down to parental choice, and it's going to be it's going to be a very challenging situation, but we're going to have to do our best with it. The next question is from Sarah Gosney. She says, I have a question for the public portion of today's meeting. If we choose option two, can we just choose daily if our kids attend from home offline? Do we decide weekly? How do teachers know who will come to class? So that will really be a conversation between you know the administrator and the parent and the teacher that yes, they can choose daily. Yes, they could choose weekly. It's going, to, it's going to really boil down to what's going to be most effective and how the parent feels about safety. And we will, we will juggle that at each school depending on the needs. So um, we're, we're hoping that parents will pick a consistent choice with whatever they choose so that it's not in one day and out the next. Um, but we will, we will be willing to work with whatever parents feel like they need for their child in that model. Okay, the next question is from Jennifer Davila. Um, she's referring to the river and mountain regions of the combined schools. So mostly Alvador Alignment and San Juan High School where there is um, a 50% um, between river and mountain schools and regions. And she asks, how will our two combined river and mountain schools plan on handling extracurricular activities like sports? Will students from the river regions not be allowed to participate if they live in a red region? I'm still concerned with the lack of Wi-Fi in the southern region of the county. Is the school prepared to making a better public Wi-Fi location for students to use? I still think that the district is making me choose between the health of my family and my child's education. Do you comment? I think the internet one was addressed. Yeah. You want to address this. So yeah. the sports piece, we're really waiting for further guidance as far as the Navajo Nation and what's decided there. Because honestly, um, if students live in the red region right now, we 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 can't make that decision without support of the Navajo Nation. So we're really waiting on that piece. Okay. Um, this comment is from Charissa Ben. She states, "Hello, Board President." Superintendent and board members, I speak to you as a parent of a child at Montezuma Creek Elementary School. My concern is no matter what plans come into place, we, schools in the South, have to still abide by what the Navajo Nation president puts in place. I know that for a fact we cannot have large gatherings of five or more in an area, so schools soon starting, we are very concerned and worried. Cases on or near the reservations have not decreased in numbers. Local, county, state, and neighboring states continue to see high numbers of cases. I, as a parent, am very concerned for our students, staff, and administrators who are planning to return. I believe we should open up in phases. Phase one, distance learning, as we did back from March. Send packets out and online with teachers. Distance delivery of all instruction. Phase two, hybrid learning. Combines face-to-face -face learning with distance learning. Campuses allowed to open with limits on class sizes social distancing requirements. Phase three, face-to-face -face learning. Students attend school on campus. This is when campuses are allowed to reopen at full capacity. I know there might be some flaws in my statement, but seeing what we go through here in Montezuma Creek and surrounding areas is hard. We value our children and staff. Thank you for your time. Sharisa Ben, parent of a sixth grader. Uh, I would just say thank you for that comment and I think She's spot on. I mean, that's what we're waiting for. You know, when we receive an official declaration from the Navajo Nation, um, we will comply with that. The, the board has stated that they will comply with that. Um, it's possible, to be, depending on what that official declaration is, that exactly how she described that in her comment is how it could roll out for our schools in our San Juan River region. So I think at this time, we're just waiting for that further direction. Um, I think the beauty of the uh, models of learning is that we can adapt uh, the three learning models for whatever situations or official declarations come out and that's part of the reason they were designed that way is so that we can be in compliance with with anything that's been requested of our schools no matter which region they're in i would add that even today i received an email from the department of education from the navajo nation and they are inquiring as to what our precautions precautions and plans are in place and i wanted to wait until after this meeting to see what became official 
I'll respond to that either tomorrow or Monday. But that, and I, and that's all I know at this point. Other than I know they're having discussions at the Navajo Nation level. I don't know if they will come out with a very stringent declaration or if they will just look into what we have and see if they approve it. I don't know. But this idea of inquiring of what we're doing has me wondering. So just be aware of that. Okay, the next comment is from Leanne Parker. She has four questions. Um, I'll go through them quickly. Hopefully we get all of them in. Um, one, after the data comes in from student registration at the end of July, is it possible for a teacher to be assigned to work as a mentor coach for students who are not in their school but have chosen option two? How will teachers know this? Question two. Can we, should we answer that question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we do, we do know that that is a possibility, yes. And it will totally depend on the numbers that come out of registration. So it could be that the teacher um, mentors students in another school, or it could be that we with the numbers that come out, we could do it within a school or within a community. So we're going to try to do the most efficient and, and you know, make the best choices we can um, to make that happen. But there's, it could happen district-wide or it could happen at school level. Will teachers be given a choice as to whether they teach on campus in a live setting or serve as support students in option two? Are we taking into consideration teacher concerns, especially if they themselves have risk factors such as health conditions, diabetes, asthma, age, etc. So I think we've already addressed that there is a process in place for those that are high risk. Um, and then as far as the first part of the question, I think we've addressed that as well, that, that our current expectation is that teachers will come to the building. Um, there are some components, even with an online learning teacher, um, that they would still need to participate in some collaborative processes and things within the building that they would need to be there in person. If we found that that was not the case, then that would be another discussion at a later time. Additionally, I would like to see an article included in the parent packet that reassures them of their child's well-being if the online option is selected. Recently, a professor psychologist was interviewed on one of the local TV stations that reiterated the importance of reassuring parents that students will not be affected in a detri detrimental way over the long term for having to participate in an online schooling mode, that students will handle things just as well as their parents and the adults in their lives do. It would be wise to include this message in addition to the KSL article mentioned before. So just in response to that, I was part of our re-entry plans for our schools, um, social emotional is part of that re-entry plan. So although that may not be public facing right now, each of the individual schools are working on working with Trevor Olson and our student services department and with our social workers um, to really look at what options are available for social emotional supports and for social emotional learning. We know that's also um, an instructional area that our teachers support. So we're looking at a variety of options. There is some additional grant funding um, that it will be used for that. So we will be addressing that. Um, fourth question from Leon Parker. If a student, for example, chooses BYU-Idaho coursework, then they are not needing services from the district, and the district doesn't need the WPU anyways. Why are the options for online limited to Edgenuity and schools PLP? How involved is the teacher assigned from these two programs that are being given as choices? Where can we find information on these two options? BYU-Idaho coursework does follow all common core standards as well. Can we use this as an option? So um, schools PLP and Edgenuity are already, are already programs that the, the district is using. And um, you, I mean, teach, students can take an independent study class from BYU. Um, that's totally up to the, up the student and we can make that work as well. Um, we will be putting out a flyer. Um, Kit and our team will be work. our online team will be working on putting out a flyer that has all of the details about the courses that are offered and how to go about that, that process of working with a counselor and, and setting up registration. So that will be forthcoming. Did I miss part of that question? I think I think the other part Teacher of that is tonight. that we're vetted. We're, these oh, are programs yes. that we've used within the district, so we feel like they're vetted. We know the support, the level of support from the company. Um, you know, we have looked at other options, but we feel confident that these programs that we have are going to be the best option at this time because we have used those programs in the past. 
And Leanne Parker closes with, once again, thank you for all the thought and efforts that have gone into this proposed plan for the 2020 or 2020-21 school year amidst all the uncertainties involved. It is no easy task to weigh all the options. The next comment is from Kate Gobble. Dear board members, I have three students that will be attending Monticello Elementary this fall. I have been watching the meeting, and while none of this is ideal, I appreciate the time and thoughtfulness that everyone has done in putting the plan together. I especially appreciate so much emphasis on parent choice. I did not want to make my opinion heard on one issue. I do, oh, sorry. I did want to make my opinion heard on one issue. I was disappointed in the banning of volunteers and visitors according to the presentation handouts and Superintendent Nielsen's comments. While I do understand where the ban is coming from, I think there could have been simple ways to ensure safety, such as requiring volunteers to wear face masks at all times, sanitizing their hands upon entry, scheduling specific times for them to come so they aren't congesting hallways with random visits or large numbers, and symptom and temperature checks at the office. Our teachers are already overworked and adjusting to the new requirements are going to be hard, not just for them, but the students. Volunteers come in to help teachers make copies, lead music or art classes, help with reading groups, holiday parties, PTA work, and dozens of other ways. Volunteers help alleviate some of the busy work from teachers, give students something to look forward to, and foster good parent-teacher relationships and communication. Good relationships are going to be even more essential in this changing climate. If the volunteer is a parent, it allows the students to see that education is important enough to volunteer time for. I don't have to list all the ways volunteers are beneficial, as I'm sure you are all aware of what they do and how they benefit students and staff. I just wanted to be on record so you could hear my thoughts. I hope that this will be able to be re revisited soon so we can try to get our teachers and students as many benefits as possible. I really do appreciate everyone's hard work on the best ways to get students back to the classroom safely. Thank you for your time and consideration, Kate Gobble. Can I just say that we, I really appreciate that comment and we have had, we had quite a bit of discussion around making that decision. And it is our hope that we will get to a place where we can phase visitors and volunteers back in as quickly as possible. So that is something that we were we were sad about that was one of the guidelines the recommended guidelines from the state as far as limiting the number of people in and out of the building and that was the reason that we chose to go that direction but we absolutely are on board with you we want to move that direction as quickly as possible and i just have to say we love our volunteers and we cannot wait until you can come back in the buildings so stay tuned the next comment is from rachel lyman she says, you talk about a reasonable amount of time to remove masks. What do you consider a reasonable amount of time? Are you going to allow teachers and students to be taking them off and on constantly, like speaking inside the classroom? I understand certain individuals may not be able to wear a mask for different reasons, but to everyone else, I would expect them to be worn as much as possible when inside a building, even when physically distanced. I also feel like if you are making online an option for parents, then the district should be getting food to kids and supporting their internet connection. Thanks, Rachel Lyman. I would speak to that. I like the way she worded that, and that would be my response as well. If reasonably possible, they should be wearing them. And, I, and as I spoke, I, I don't really know the amount of ex uh, exceptions, but I think that logically and reasonably, schools and administrators will have discussions and make those decisions because the expectation is exactly as it was worded there, that as reasonably as much as can be worn, they should be worn. Next comment is from Brandon Johnson. I was wondering about Model 1 or Model 2, but my question is, is there any change to the teacher's schedule for in-class classes? Should teachers expect a schedule similar to the schedule pre-COVID? For example, should teachers expect to teach a lesson a day from Monday through Friday? Let me speak to that. So teachers can expect to have, have a schedule similar to what we've had in the past. However, we have taken into consideration the need to build in a, build in a time for student support and then, a, and then continue time for preparation. And those will be separate. So we are looking at options. And um, honestly, based on what comes out of our registration process, that's when we will make those final decisions. 
but the, we're trying to keep the schedule as close to what it is now, but adding in um, some time for that scholar time and continued preparation. So it may be a short, it may be a little bit of a shortened day for students where we add in some extra time um, for that scholar support, um, keeping our preparation in place. That's that's one. That's the main model that we've talked about. Okay. Um, this comment is from Paula at City Allen. My concern for my one and only daughter for this upcoming school year is a big deal to me. She's our only child, and with many miscarriages, her life is extremely precious to us. She has learned the new norm of hand washing, mask wearing, and social distancing, but not many are as mature as she is at her age. Back in January, she became sick and took time off, but two weeks off school was too long for her. And so when she had mild conditions, a slight cough, she re returned back to school wearing a mask, and there was a lot of students who made fun of her. That is how she protected others from getting sick. But my point is not other students will respect, follow protocols, and adhere to the new norm. There has to be other ways to educate. My sister-in-law is a teacher in Chinle, and they're providing Chromebooks and internet for their students while she teaches from her classroom. Right now, my daughter can't even attend any volleyball games because she's considered in the red for the state and reservation. She sees all her teammates smile with lots of joy and happiness on their posts. Can you put yourselves in my shoes as a parent and see your child in sadness because she cannot participate? My daughter rides the bus for 45 minutes plus one way. How is that going to work? Right now she has online classes with MS2 Boston. They provided a jetpack from Verizon for the summer program and they use Zoom for classes. It's working great. I just hope the school board looks beyond possible approaches for the future scholars. I trust you are all wise, courteous, strong-minded, and considerate to be a part of the San Juan School Board and to make great choices. God bless. I think that is like the perfect, you know, example of why parents have to have a choice. Um, I mean, we just, you know, from what that parent shared, it, it just touches my heart and, and it makes me just remember that what this is really about is people. Um, this is about people we care about in our communities, our students, our families, and our parents. And you know, that's just a perfect, beautiful story of why it's so important that parents have options and that they have a choice. Okay, that's it, Eva. Um, I, I'll refresh my... That sign back oh. in. It didn't update while you <laughs> You're just <laughs> starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Only updates every 24 hours. Like, here you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Carry on. You're welcome. Yes, thanks so much. Oh, I have a question regarding all of these. So we, well, a we'll approve the plan today, I, I assume. I'm anticipating we're going to approve this. But over time, as things evolve, and we've already talked about, you know, when appropriate. So is there is there anything that we need to do after this as things evolved and the evolve and the plan and there needs to be changes. Is it required? We're, we're approving this because the state's requiring it. Yeah. But will we be required to will approve anything you that You have changes? given me direction to follow all directives. So I would assume, and you need to tell me differently if you feel like I'm making an improper assumption here, that should the governor or the Navajo Nation come out with a declaration even two weeks from now, two weeks into school, our immediate action would be to be in compliance with that. And then we would either have to call an emergency meeting if you if you didn't want me to that, or we we would, in the next board meeting, uh, you know, I'd update you on where we're at and why we made that change. But, and, th and then in each of the monthly board meetings, I think we need to have an agenda item where we review where are we at, what are we seeing, do you have recommendations for updates, for revisions, and that would be a, a every month process as well. But the things could change quickly with an official declaration. Okay. With and my understanding of board direction. 
And if I understand correctly, if, if and when or whatever the Navajo Nation mandates, that is for the Navajo Nation and it will affect all schools yep. on the Navajo Nation. Yes. Is that correct? Correct. And if, this, if the governor makes a mandate, does it does all it affect schools. all of our schools? Yes. Okay. Now, if they were some reason in, um, you know, not in compliance with one another, they were in opposite opposite directions. You know, we might have to have an, some a lot of discussion and decide where to go with that. But I don't perceive that that's going to happen. Okay. So when when we get to this um, action item, do we um, approve this plan as well as giving you the authority to make changes as necessary based on the state of Utah's um, Depends on mandates how and the word the motion. Yeah, that, that would be saying. one possibility. Yes. Yeah, that word the motion. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Should we work? You know, should it be worded that way? We already so kind of have that in place because Navajo Nation I kind of already feel that's a little bit in place because I, you have directed me to follow being compliance with the Navajo Nation okay. in the state of Utah. So a little of that is already in place, but that would still be probably wise to word it that way if that's how you wish to have it. Thank you. to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We need to go into closed session before we do action items. So the two items for closed session will be um, the discussion of real property and personnel. So I need a motion for both, please. I just have a question, why are we jumping down and not, and we're not following our, why are we not doing that? We can't do the first action item until we go into closed session. Okay, but, oh, let's see. Um, see, there's not anything on there, so we haven't had a chance. When I look at the pro property acceptance, we haven't had time to to look at that over a period of time, so I'm going to suggest that we're not going to have an action item. But we don't want that yet because we haven't been close today anyway, because we haven't had any time to to look at it. You know, I'm not going to look at a contract to make a split second. You know, I need a time for okay, me to so let's, review that. Let's let the majority decide. But, yeah. Do you feel we should go on the close to discuss the bluff? Property. I'm looking at Nelson. He's sitting there. <laughs> there is additional information, right? Correct. Yeah, we've got a couple of emails. Even timely. That's why I jumped down for that because. I think there's additional information well, that the board should at least be. Yes, Steve. I think it's your discretion. I personally feel we should go into close to discuss and I cannot do the action items. You don't feel I, there is a discussion? No, I think there's a discussion. Action? I think there's not. For me, I wouldn't vote on. A contract that I haven't had time to to review because we, we don't have any of that information, do we? I haven't been able to find it. Do we have it? Board President. It's attached yes, on there Nelson. in the closed session. It's been attached on there since that, last week. Uh, whomever made the motion and second to withdraw their motion, I do agree with Mary. Okay. Then let's just go to the possible action items. Can someone withdraw that? Do we need to withdraw? We just guess we don't vote. Mm. It is possible that. action items. Yeah, you don't have to take action on them. Okay. All right, so we're going to go to the possible action items. Um, do I have a motion for the bluff property offer acceptance? 
Okay, number two, early literacy grant approval for the 2021 school year. I need a motion for that. I move to accept the early literacy grant approval for 2020-2021. Okay, motion by Mary. Second, Lucille, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, number three, Monticello Red Home Demolition. Demolition. That's the right word. I can Hello. Yes. Do I have a motion for that? Um, I move that we we how to say this. We do as proposed by administration and and demolish the red home for connecting to future projects for San Luis Okay, motion by Steve. Second by Lucille. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The next two items we had talked about last month, we didn't feel it needed more discussion, so that's why they are on there for approval, unless and we can discuss them when the motion's made if you feel you need to. So I need an approval for the Native American Students Participation Data. Board, board President? Yes. I would like to make a motion and combine both sure. uh, action items, okay? The first action okay. item, number four, approve Native American Students Participation Data. And the second that will be included will be the number five, approve formal board. Uh, responses to suggestions and questions regarding improving the education of Native American students. Perfect. And uh, we'll make a motion to uh, do both of those at the same time. Okay, thank you, Nelson. Motion by Nelson. Second by Lucille. Any discussion? All in favor? No. Oh, go ahead, Nelson. Oh, no, no discussion. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and to approve our San Juan School District COVID-19 student reentry plan. I move to approve the San Juan School District um, COVID-19 student reentry plan for the 2020-2021 school year. Okay, motion by Mary. I need a second. Oh. Second. Okay, second by Steve. Discussion? I just want yes. to. Question. Yes. Would, would that include the, um, maybe a possibility of mass mandate coming forth by Utah Governor Gary Herbert or Navajo Nation, uh, President Johnson Ned? Yes, would you like, we can redo the motion to add that on. Or would you just like to state that? Like, I, I would like I would like that for the record. Okay. Do you want to withdraw your motion? Amend it. Amend it. Technically, you can't really amend a motion, okay. but I will withdraw my motion. I will. Yeah. I, forget from time to time. But I'm gonna to just I'm gonna withdraw the, the motion okay. and I will um, now now here's my motion. I approved I move to approve the San Juan School District COVID nineteen school reentry plan for the 2020-21 school year and um, give superintendent authority to make changes as necessary as mandated by the state of Utah and the Navajo Nation. To the areas in which it um, they have jurisdiction. have jurisdiction over. Okay, motion by Mary. Second. Second by Second. Steve. Discussion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Okay. Now I need a motion to go into closed session to discuss real estate and personnel. I move to go into closed session to discuss real estate and personnel. Motion by Mary, second by Lucille. Roll call. Steve Black, yes. Lucille Cove, yes. Mary Shumway, yes. Lori Mon, yes. 
Yep. Okay. All right. We're going into closed session.